It is now 6 p.m. <laughs> on April 2nd, 2024. And I'm gonna call the City of Iowa City meeting to order. Roll call, please. Alter. Here. Burgess. Dunn. Here. Harmson. Here. Mo. Here. Saleh. Yeah. Ooh. Teak. Here. All right, I want to welcome everyone to your city hall. We have a full house here at City Hall, and to anyone that is virtually joining us, welcome. All right. We're going to go on to proclamations. 2A is National Library Week. <laughs> Whereas libraries serve as vital hubs for connection, learning, and exploration, and are dedicated to ensuring equitable access to information and services for all community members, regardless of race, ethnicity, creed, ability, sexual orientation, gender, identi gender identity, or socioeconomic status. And whereas libraries prioritize privacy, defend the right to read freely, champion intellectual freedom, and serve as cornerstones of democracy, promoting the free exchange of information and ideas for all. And whereas libraries are accessible and inclusive places that promote a sense of local connection, advance an understanding, civic engagement, and share community goals while preserving our collective heritage and knowledge, safeguarding both physical and digital resources for present and future generations. And whereas libraries play a pivotal role in economic development by providing resources and support for job seekers, entrepreneurs, and small businesses, thus contributing to local prosperity and growth. And whereas Iowa City Public Library is a center of community life that connects people of all ages with information, engages them with the world of ideas and with each other, and enriches the community by supporting learning, promoting literacy, and encouraging creativity. And whereas an Iowan authored the Library Bill of Rights, Iowa has more public libraries per capita than any other state in the nation. And over 74% of Iowans own at least one library card. <laughs> And whereas libraries, librarians, and library workers are joining library supporters and advocates across the nation to celebrate National Library Week. Now, therefore, I, Bruce T., Mayor of Iowa City, do hereby proclaim April 7th through the 13th, 2024, to be National Library Week and encourage all residents to visit the Iowa City Public Library and celebrate the access and opportunities provided by Iowa City Public Library services and programming. And to receive this is Manning uh, from the uh, Iowa Public Library. Like I had like a, a moment to say something. First, like a um, thank you, uh, everybody here, and I am deeply honored to accept the National Library Week proclamation on behalf of the Iowa City Public Library. This is a recognition that shines a light on libraries' vital role in our community. I want to repeat what you said uh, properly and for uh, about the library, but also I want to thank you to the Iowa City, Iowa City Council and our community for your support and belief in our mission. This honor refers our commitment to being uh, a cornerstone of community life, intellectual growth, and cultural enrichment. Together, we will continue to open doors to endless possibilities for everyone in our community. Thank you so much. Thank you. We're going to move on to our consent agenda. Can I get a motion to approve items three through seven, although we will have a separate consideration for 5B? So moved. moved. Second. Moved by Don, seconded by Alter. Anyone from the public like to discuss an item uh, that is three through seven, uh, except for 5B that is on our consent agenda? If you're online, please raise your virtual hand. 
see no one in person or online. Council discussion. Roll call, please. Teague? Yes. Alter? Yes. Dunn? Yes. Harmson? Yes. Moe? Yes. Salah? Yes. Motion passes, seven, uh, six to zero. Now we're gonna uh, get a motion for item 5B, please. So moved. Second. Moved by Don, seconded by Alter. So anyone from the public like to address item 5B? All right, seeing no one in person and no one online with their virtual hand raised. Uh, council discussion. Eric, I've got a question for you on this one. Um, is our cigarette permitting authority granted through the state? Yes. Is it a shall issue permitting authority? Uh, certainly the city has uh, discretion, but it's based on you know, legal disqualifications such as uh, repeated violations, um, uh, that kind of thing. Do we know what any of the violations are or if there are any violations for these? Uh, there certainly have been uh, tobacco violations for different entities. I'm not sure if those entities are among those listed under new cigarette permits uh, okay. under item 5B. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Roll call, please. Alter? Yes. Dunn? No. Harmson? Yes. Mo? No. Salah? No. Teague? Yes. Motion? Failed. Fails. No, we have. It was three. Oh, it's three and three. Three, yeah. three. Yeah, so motion fails. Um, three and three. Yes. Okay. All right. Now is an, uh, we're moving on to community comment. This is an opportunity for the public to that want to speak on any item that is not on our regular agenda. Um, I do want to see a raise of hands of how many individuals want to speak. Got anybody in the hallway who wants to speak? One person out in the hallway. One person in the hallway. Two people in the hallway. Okay. Inside, if you want to speak. Yep. So we'll allot for three minutes. And I also want to make mention um, that public comment is intended so that all members of the public can be heard by the council because community comment is for items not properly noticed on the agenda. Council cannot engage in discussion or debate due to open meeting laws. So we'll welcome you at this time. Uh, there is also in the back sign-in sheets that you can sign in and drop it in the basket. It's on the table back there. Otherwise, we'll ask that you sign your name. Um, and we ask that you state your name and the city you're from. Welcome. Good evening, my name is Emma Denny. I've been here before and I think you know why I'm here. I am a transsexual woman and I am here with many friends and community members to reiterate our demand that you protect trans people in this city and to respond to some things members of this council have said in this regard. Josh Moe, in an email to a friend, asked that we treat you all more like allies. He pointed out that you support drag in this city, that you let people have pride yard signs, which is useless and meaningless if you want to actually protect our community. Josh, you mentioned that in new city buildings, you're going to have gender neutral bathrooms, which is wonderful, and I know several people who appreciate that, but I am much more afraid of someone calling the police on me if I use the women's room as I am a woman. I'm sure you would understand why that might be a concern. Megan Alter, in a response to another friend of mine, seemed to imply that should anything happen because we threatened people in this community, spoke up for our own safety, it would be on us if vulnerable populations lost funding. And I'm sorry that you seem to think that some members of your community matter more than others. It's pathetic and demeaning that you think you can sign a proclamation for Trans Day of Visibility which does nothing but put a target on our backs if you don't protect us. 
You'll hear from many other members of my community this evening illustrating other points that they would like you to address, but I would like to reiterate our demands. First and foremost, that you create some sort of proclamation, legislation, or, or, or ordinance for non-enforcement of anti-trans laws in this state. I understand that that language is difficult for you all. I highly recommend looking at Madison, Wisconsin's language about prioritizing enforcement. Secondly, if we are to make Johnson County and Iowa City a safe haven for trans people, as many in the community already consider it to be, then people need to be able to afford to live here. That means actually taking action against landlords and others that strip us of our right to access housing and to meaningfully monetarily support people fleeing to come here. I know that this will simply get a response saying that your hands are tied, that you're worried about what Des Moines might do. And I challenge you to do right by your community, to get creative, and to show that you actually care or you won't have your jobs anymore. Thank you. Welcome. Please state your name and city you're from. My name is Bologna Alu. I'm a resident of Iowa City. I'm a 19-year-old transsexual woman, and I am shocked, disappointed, and angry at the absolute cowardice of the people sitting in front of me right now. The blatant refusal to do anything of meaning, the requests to be treated as allies while you give us empty words and no protections. It's sad. I hope none of you have your jobs come next election cycle. To my community who is here with me today, Thank you to my trans siblings, friends, and We family. do ask that you address the council. Thank you. Okay, sure, Teague. My community stands behind me today. They care about me. You do not. I will address you as a way of speaking to them. The people standing behind me are soon going to be asked to do extremely difficult things to protect the people they love. They're going to be asked to break state laws that discriminate against trans people in healthcare. They are going to be asked to fight with us. And if they do not have your support, it is going to be so, so much harder for them. Stand with us. Do not invoke the names of our dead community members for brownie points. <laughs> Fix the problems in this city. Give us some meaningful change. I know that landlords hate regulating their own, but God, do something. Protect us or we will die and we will leave and it will be your fault. Thank you for your time. Thank you, welcome. Hello, my name is Clara Reinen and I'm from Iowa City, Iowa. We are back once again to ask you to do your job and protect your constituents. The transgender community needs you to listen and to do whatever needs to be done to make Iowa City a sanctuary city. 
Throughout the week, I've seen the email exchanges between you and my friends who are much better about remembering to email their city councilors than I am, and what I've seen has really shocked me. Time and time again, you have told my friends and other concerned citizens that your hands are tied and making Iowa City a sanctuary city would put a target on our town's back from the state. I understand that this is scary. You all hold immense power and responsibility and the thought that your actions could cause negative repercussions should make you scared. I hope it does. I understand that you can't physically raise your hand, but I want you to think about how many of you are afraid to lose state funding. Sit with that fear for a moment. Sit with the anxieties about how community members might look at you, what they might say to you on the street as you walk past them. Maybe your favorite grocery store wouldn't feel like a safe place to shop anymore because you don't know what community members are thinking when they see you. But that is how it feels every day to be trans. And not for any decision that you've made, but for an innate part of yourself that cannot and should not need to be hidden. So I ask you this rhetorically, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to use your fear to take action against a state that is passing unconstitutional laws? Gender identity is still a protected class under civil rights laws in Iowa, no matter how hard Jeff Shipley tried to get them taken away. You have a responsibility as elected officials to take action against unconstitutional and fascist laws. We have been told our entire lives that if we want to make change, we need to get involved in local politics. And that's what we're here doing. But now that we're here, now that we are demanding to be protected to and listened to, what are you doing in response? Local politics suddenly can't do anything, it seems. If this is the case, what is left for us to do? Lay down and accept that you are all as worthless and as powerless as you appear to be? Is that really the takeaway you want us to go home with? The takeaway that we will flee this state with? I'm not asking, I'm demanding. Do your job. Sue the state if you have to. With each meeting that passes and you remain actionless, you are making it abundantly clear that you are not politicians because you care about people, but that you are politicians because you want power. And I refuse to support elected officials who are not protecting my community. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Please state your name and city you're from. Good evening. My name is Lexa Turno. I'm initially from Atlanta, Georgia, but I've been a resident of Iowa City for the past five years. I moved here for my master's degree with the intention of moving immediately after I finished, but once meeting the community and the city here, that very quickly changed. Iowa City is special. I have community here like I've never experienced anywhere else, as many other community members have come before you and stated as well. I'm here today to urge you, along with many other community members, to protect your trans community members and make Iowa City a sanctuary city. I am an educator in Iowa City Community School District, in which I feel very fortunate to be surrounded by many teachers who are incredibly supportive of our LGBTQ students. These students are growing up in a state that is proposing hundreds of bills each year that scare them, that embolden bigots to discriminate against them, that attempt to change curriculum to teach false information, that bar them from access to their LGBTQ history, and that legally allow harassment and bullying. These students do not have a choice in where they grow up and where they attend school. I'm glad to be in Iowa City and ICCSD, surrounded by so many queer community members, students, educators, and friends. These students have a right to live here as who they are. These students have a right to grow up protected from being harassed by the state. A sanctuary city status will provide refuge for the many trans people across the state who call Iowa City home, and many more that we can welcome in under our protection. It will also protect our students. Iowa City counselors, tell our students that they belong here. It is their home just as much as it is yours. As educators, it is our job to foster a safe environment so that students can focus on their education. How can they be kids, focus on their schooling, learn about who they are and who they want to be if they're under attack from the state? Before you are our council people, you are our community members. Your neighbors, my best friends, my students need your protection and your action. Adopt sanctuary city status.
Moreover, these bills are not just endangering our students, but also our educators. Iowa has been known as having one of the best education systems in the country, evidenced by a national standardized test, the Iowa test, named for our state. If we do not protect our LGBTQ students and teachers, we will continue to lose passionate educators. Educators who are skilled at their jobs in their own right, but also provide a safe space for queer students. I have experienced this firsthand as a queer educator and know how much it means to our students to have this representation in our schools. With these discriminatory and fascist laws in our state, educators may complete teacher preparatory programs here and then immediately leave upon completion. It is already happening. People are already leaving. The result of this will negatively affect everyone here, not just queer students and teachers. Students should feel safe, seen, and represented in our school. Protect trans students and educators and make Iowa City a sanctuary city. Thank you. Thank you. Excuse me, did you, did you sign in or leave a name tag? Apologies. Thank you. Welcome, please state your name and city. Hey, my name is Brandon Ross, and um, I'm here about uh, thinking globally and acting locally and talk uh, about a little bit about international situations, which I hope everybody here, everybody uh, who is in Iowa City who is aware uh, would take action simply by writing or calling your uh, Congress people. Right now, we are arming basically an apartheid state out in the Middle East. Uh, which is slaughtering a whole group of people uh, in Gaza. It, uh, none of us could possibly agree to something like that. Uh, we are arming uh, a neo-fascist uh, Kiev regime, which has attacked uh, eastern Ukraine for now 10 years. Uh, we've sent uh, hun over $100 billion out there. We are occupying Syria, uh, a third of Syria. Uh, half of Syrians are displaced, half of that group of people are refugees. Um, we're talking about many, many, many people, lots of children. We have attacked uh, Yemen, uh, we have bombed Somalia, we continue military operations in Iraq, and our bombing uh, forays do not come with even our own constitutional law uh, being followed, which is the War Powers Act. We don't even vote anymore to our Congress does not even vote anymore to appropriate these actions. Uh, so recently, you know, I'm, I'm half Ukrainian on my mom's side. Uh, we're from Kiev. Uh, the Kiev regime, uh, basically in 2014, the U.S. overthrew, helped overthrow a democratically elected president in Ukraine. That was Viktor Yanukovych. Uh, and then they installed a government which was very violent and right-wing and nationalist. And they attacked eastern Ukraine over eight years until Russia interceded on behalf of Ukraine. Russia did not attack Ukraine. Russia interceded on behalf of Ukraine. And the U.S. was supporting the arming of this group. And we have records that show that we, we armed them for eight years. Lindsey Graham, who was in Ukraine in 2014, a couple years ago said, this is a good deal for us. We supply the weapons and they supply the men. Well, there's over 600,000 casualties now from the Kiev regime, over 50,000 from eastern Ukraine, over 50,000 Russian people. That was a highly cynical remark. Recently, a few months ago, Victoria Nuland, who was leaving the State House, she's been there since uh, George W. Bush working for Cheney, she said uh, it helps our arms industry to be out there because our arms industry hires a workforce. It's good for the working class. We are in these places cynically. Please write, please call your Congress members. Please, please, please. The doomsday clock is closest as it's ever been Thank to you. midnight. Thank you. Also, do war tax resistance. Welcome, please state your name and city you're from. Yeah, hi, my name is Nix. Uh, I live in Iowa City. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about my experience in the jail here in Iowa City as a transsexual person. 
I know a lot of you, probably all of you will make excuses regarding this because it's the county jail and it's not something that you have jurisdiction over. But where will the Iowa City Police Department take the trans people that they arrest because you allow them to enforce transphobic laws? They will bring them to that jail. I'm sure many of you have heard that the jail put a trans person in solitary confinement simply for being trans. And if you haven't, then I would say you're not an ally because we've been screaming about all this uh, for months now. Um, I was that person who was put in solitary confinement simply for being trans. And before you make excuses, probably thinking, well, maybe you deserved it. I asked them why I was being placed in solitary after already being placed in the female ward. And they told me, quote, because you don't identify as a woman. I sat there panicking, crying, and shaking. I looked around the cold, bright room with scratched words in the walls. There was no way for me to ask for anything or to alert the deputies if I was in need. I was all the way down at the end of the hall, and I thought if there was a fire, I will die. No one will come to save me. They surely won't just unlock all the doors. They will leave me here to die. I sat there blaming myself. Why had I told them I was trans when they asked? This was my fault. I shouldn't be proud of my identity in a space like this. What was I thinking? But I'm so fucking proud. And when they asked, I just told them the truth. I guess the jail here in Iowa City decided that the answer is to psychologically torture incarcerated trans people. Because let's be clear, solitary confinement is psychological torture. The person in the cell next to me was having a severe mental health crisis. And instead of being cared for and supported, they were ignored, left to bang on the door and threatened to kill themselves. No one should ever experience solitary confinement. I emailed all of you about our demands. I had to email you all twice and text some of you in order to get a response. Bruce Teague never emailed me back. Your responses or lack of responses show us how you feel about trans people, how you believe that there is a dollar amount that we are worth, listing drag shows and progressive yard signs as proof that you care for this community, meanwhile refusing to meet our demands that would create meaningful material change. Josh Mo, as a white gay man, you owe all of your rights and so-called freedom to trans women of color. You asked to be treated as an ally, but let me say this. Allyship isn't about tolerating trans people. Thank you. It is about not tolerating transphobia, which means not enforcing transphobia. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome. Please state your name and city you're from. Hello, my name is Maria Jose Plata Flores. I was born in Bogota, Colombia, migrated to Iowa City in 2021. I work for the Emma Goldman Clinic and I am co chair of Iowa City DSA. I'm here to support uh, making Iowa City a sanctuary city. The concept of sanctuary is key to me as an immigrant, and I understand that there is different ways that a sanctuary city can be as such. I've heard a lot of talk about keeping our transgender and non-binary folks of Iowa City safe, and of course, I support that. I also want to talk about the people that are coming here, the forcefully displaced trans people, especially the trans people of Missouri, now that their state has banned them to access medicine. Uh, what I see happening with abortion services, since the Emma Goldman Clinic receives every week people from all around the state and all around the country, the same thing is going to happen with gender therapy. And I think that we will fail them if when they come here, they don't find a reliable transportation and housing system because we don't have that. There is a clear inequality in the way that transportation and housing is uh, given away 
in our state and people benefit from that. You know who? There is people that profit for people that aren't housed and people that profit from the fact that others cannot, are not able to be transported. So I urge you that if you take the decision to make this a sanctuary city, you take all that money that you are willing to spend on the three police departments that we have in the area, and please invest it in making the life of the forcefully displaced trans people and our own trans people and non-binary people more accessible and livable here. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome. Hello, uh, my name is Ash Fell. I'm originally from Burlington. I moved here just a couple months ago and I very quickly uh, found a, a home in the trans community here. Um, there's, it's much more vibrant than I could have imagined. Um, I think it's wonderful here. Uh, and for that reason, you know, I would like to stay, ideally. Um, I told my parents a couple years back that it was, you know, very likely that after I fin just finished my education that I would be leaving the state because of increasingly transphobic laws. Um, and, you know, I, I would rather not spend my life lying, which is the other option. Um, so, uh, yeah, designating Iowa City as a sanctuary city uh, is kind of the only way to prevent uh, the amount of brain drain that you can reasonably deal with. Um, <laughs> Uh, the state, we, we all know that this has been a serious problem with the state uh, lately as young people flee um, and as one of those young people, uh, additionally as a part of a minority that is being increasingly targeted, um, I would prefer not to flee. I love Iowa very, very much um, and I've, I've found a home here faster than I could have imagined uh, in Iowa City. So um, yeah, I, I, I think... Uh, doing your best, at least, if not from a uh, social perspective, but uh, from an economic one, uh, you know, it would be a good idea to try and keep people here instead of having them run for their lives. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome. Hey, <clears throat> uh, my name is Tristan Bracewell. Um, I've lived in Iowa my entire life. Uh, I've lived in Iowa City since 2020. Um, and uh, I've known a lot of trans people. Um, I've had a lot of trans friends. Um, and uh, I'm kind of sick of uh, seeing them die or leave because um, those seem to be the only options. Um, and here in uh, Iowa City, I know we've talked a lot about how uh, you, as elected officials and on the council, um, like to give lip service to a lot of this kind of stuff with proclamations and things like that. Um, but you don't follow through uh, with actual material change. Uh, so I'm obviously here speaking in support of making Iowa City a sanctuary city. Um, but uh, also I just wanna say that um, I'm honestly like a little disgusted because lately uh, there have been elected officials in Iowa City that haven't even been able to, I guess, keep up the, the veneer of uh, caring about trans people and uh, have been you know, openly uh, transphobic and uh, dismissive. And I, I haven't read all the emails, but it sounds like a lot of you guys have been that way too. Um, so I don't know, it sounds like you're not doing your research, which is embarrassing. Um, so my advice to all of you would be uh, do some research, fix your heart, or I hope you lose your job. Um, beyond that, um, I would say that um, there's been a lot of remarks about the trans community in Iowa City um, and uh, what a, a vital, uh, integral part of Iowa City culture, um, music, arts, um, you know, uh, education um, that um, they are. Um, and I think uh, it sucks that uh, you guys are not willing to take a stand to avoid um, all those things being uh, crushed and killed. Um, but also, like, I don't know, we shouldn't have to argue and prove that trans people have value um, because of those sorts of contributions because uh, human beings have value and they have human rights and uh, I don't know if you're too much of a coward to, to stand up for that and stand up against the uh, you know, right wing uh, state government and, and 
uh, the laws being passed, then I don't I don't know how you can sit here and call yourselves uh, you know, I hate this word anyway, but progressive um, or an ally or or any of that. Um, so I, I like I said earlier, I guess um, I implore you to do your research. I know a lot of you might not know. Um, what a lot of the you know language and the issues um, that we're dealing with, but that's not an excuse. Um, figure it out. Uh, get on the right side of this issue. Um, and uh, if not, I look forward to voting you out. So good luck. Thank you. Could I could I uh, have a hand raise of how many individuals still want to speak? Okay. Okay. Well, we have six more. All right. Please welcome. I'm Casper, I'm from Iowa City, and I just wanted to say that uh, any community that alienates a large part of itself uh, should be ashamed to call itself a community at all. Uh, and trans people in Iowa City are not some afterthought. We are in your bars, we are in your homes, homes, kind of, I guess. We're in your schools. We're everywhere. And we will not stop being everywhere uh, until ever. And this community will not stop being in distress until it stops listening to people, the people that live inside of it. So yeah, thank you. Thank uh, you. Did you sign in? Yes. Oh, do I need to put my little flag in there? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> thank you. Welcome. Hello again. Um, my name is Storma Brink. I work in Iowa City. Um, I am here because I was able to observe a lot of the responses that the council had to friends of mine um, who had wrote in about the possibility of getting a sanctuary city um, kind of policy ordinance, et cetera, or rather support for a sanctuary city in place. Um, and throughout those responses, um, I discovered that I think that we have a misunderstanding of what really um, the material needs are of the trans community. So I noticed like when my friends were writing into you, you were responding with things like yard signs, um, bathroom access. And while those things are great and they can be signs of allyship, um, the needs of the trans community are really more rooted in the tangible basic survival related things right now. Um, and so while I'm not, I, I'm the person who asked you a couple of weeks ago to get creative. Um, and I've discovered through reading some of those responses that you may be struggling with what to come up with in that process of getting creative. Um, so here are some of the ideas uh, that I thought of for you. So as one of the people who was previously um, uh, monitored by the police, despite the fact that I have not committed any crimes and have never been arrested, um, I thought perhaps enact either through an ordinance or as a stipulation to receive funding, penalties for police monitoring citizens not suspected of a crime. Um, funding for affordable housing, and I know that you tend to source that through nonprofits a lot, and while nonprofits can do great work in this town, there are often a lot of barriers that trans people um, experience when trying to access funding towards that housing. I have worked in nonprofits for about the last 10 years, um, and so like when you are constructing the grants related for these nonprofits, something that um, might be helpful is creating stipulations in the grants that require those nonprofits to break down the barriers and outline what those barriers are and what those actions would be um, to trans people accessing funds. So for example, when I worked at Transformative Healing, which was a sexual assault uh, advocacy organization only for LGBTQ people in Iowa, one of our um, stipulations from our grantors was that we weren't allowed to cover the deposit for someone who was emergency relocating from a domestic violence situation, but we could cover the first month's rent. And that was a huge barrier to a lot of the trans people that we served because they didn't have access to the down payment in the first place. So if you can remove items like that um, that create barriers from the grants that you're giving out. Um, also perhaps like things like creating penalties for um, the improper use of solitary confinement in Johnson County detainment facilities. Um, which what happened to Nix was, I think, a misunderstanding of the protections afforded under PREA um, to trans people. And so there there was like a you know ruling related to that. Um, but uh, yeah, these are just some of my ideas. Thank you. Thank you. Could you could you repeat your name? Uh, Welcome. Did we get her name? Hello, uh, Jenny Kula, Iowa City. 
after last city council meeting where we, dem where we demanded sanctuary policy to protect trans and other people facing discrimination, we learned that the city council would not be taking any measures to protect its vulnerable population. The city fears that a non-enforcement policy would put a spotlight on Iowa City and its policies. I would like to ask the city council what they believe the current state of affairs to be. Do you not hear how the GOP talks about us, about Iowa City? They hate us because we are a bastion of education and three thought. They hate us because of our diversity and they hate us because we yell in the face of injustice. The notion that we must stop asking for protections as it may draw the attention of the governor's regime is foolish. They are already watching and beating down on us. The governor appoints the officials who are in charge of the university police. They operate and surveil under her direction. What local policy is it that must be protected? Policy to build a factory that will pollute our air? Policy that does nothing to prevent the closing of our schools? Policy that increases the funding of our oppressive military police state? The fascist state government in Iowa is throwing everything they have at us, but the city government is unwilling to respond in any meaningful way. It is cowardice, weak, and shameful. If we continue to do nothing, this genocidal rhetoric posed against trans people will only get worse. When the bell tolls, our blood will be on your hands. To the gay members of the city council, they will come for us and then they will come for you. You stand with us or you stand against yourself. Welcome. <clears throat> my name is Trent. I'm a resident of Iowa City and a transsexual. My family is from the more rural parts of the state. And every time I go home to see my mother, I am unsafe as someone who's discriminated against in the state of Iowa. I'm I am grateful that the community of Iowa City is accepting of me, but this is still a city in Iowa that is com complicit in this discrimination. The city does not have to enforce the fascism coming out of Des Moines, but is not willing to do the right thing for its citizens. Instead, you allow the UIPD to terrorize trans people. There are people in this community that are too scared to show up and participate in their democracy, lest they be put on a list, illegally monitored, and tracked down uh, for us months after doing something that was not even illegal. I ask that you do anything to help the trans people of Iowa City. People seek refuge from their rural, dangerous communities in Iowa City, and that is, not, that is no longer an option under your government. I love Iowa, and I would really rather not leave this state, but if there's nowhere safe here, then I have no choice. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. I am Lisa Bakkenstedt. I have lived here since 1971. I have seen a lot of changes in Iowa City. Um, we've always been very, very liberal, and we've been a safe haven before, and I think we should remain a safe haven. Um, Originally, I came here to talk about Pogliars, but this is m much more important to me because my, I have, thank you, I have two trans daughters, and we have been talking about leaving the state because of all the scary things that, that are coming to light with the right wing folks. Um, my kids, they don't feel safe with a lot of the rhetoric that's being talked about. Um, we have to remain a sanctuary city for, for people. It's a community. And this is the, always the sort of thing that the, this community has stood for, is the people that are trodden on and that sort of thing. I'm sorry, I can't think of the words. But it, it's, it's very, very important. And please save the Pogli Ice Building. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. I'm Chris Russell. I am a new resident of Iowa City. I have been here for eight months now. So I actually come from Oklahoma City. Um, and I come from Oklahoma City partly as a way of running away because of how bad it is in Oklahoma um, for trans folks. I'm not sure if you know, you've seen the news lately, but um, the passing of Nex Benedict in particular um, comes to mind. Um, Nex died because there wasn't a community surrounding him. Um, Nex died because of policy failure. Um, Nex's death could have been avoidable. There's a lot more deaths that could be avoidable if you make this a sanctuary city. 
there's a lot of small town folk. Uh, I have friends from Dyersville and Ankeny who come here to seek refuge away from bigots. Um, and so while people are leaving, people are coming here. You should welcome them with open arms and make this place a sanctuary. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. My name is Tara McGovern. I live in Coralville. I had decided not to speak because Clara Ryan actually said everything that I wanted to say. And then you cut the microphone of my friend Nick's when they were talking to you about how they were treated in your jail. And I stand before you and you stare back at me because Robert's rules of order allow you to hide from <laughs> treating people like human beings. And when I asked you for help, Sean Harmson, who won't even make eye contact with me, because your Democratic County attorney was prosecuting me on a charge that I could have had up to 13 months of jail, in jail, your excuse was that the state attorney would have prosecuted me harder. That is, I'm trying not to swear in front of you. I'm going to, for my own, challenge, try not to. I don't understand how people that I have known for years can look back at me and write me off in this way, write our community off in this way. And you think that just because the county is going to help us, the county has committed to helping us, that means that you're off the hook, you are not off the hook. You can get with us on this, or we will be working against you. You can't hide behind court etiquette. You can't hide behind whatever this visage of democracy. We are people in your community. We're some of the coolest fucking people in your community. And, we're gonna, and we will leave if you make us. So we elected you. And it's time for you to have some moral courage and to stand with us. I have yet to hear from any of you individually, with the exception of Andrew Dunn, who has written and communicated with me, and Laura Burgess, who, ha who you know, of all of you, <laughs> deciding not to help us. Laura, as an attorney who actually knows about the law, is the one of you. <laughs> who decided that helping us was actually the right thing to do. Just reflect on your, on your humanity. And look at the people in front of you. And just do something. This is embarrassing. We have been embarrassed on the world stage. Thank you. Thanks to everyone that came and spoke. We're going to move on to our uh, planning and zoning matters, which is no item peace. number nine. No peace! No justice! 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 No peace! No peace! Item 9A is rezoning 302 through 316 East Bloomington Street, local historic landmark. Ordinance rezoning property located at 302 through 316 East Bloomington Street from Central Business Service Zone to CB2 with a historic district overlay zone. And I am going to open the public hearing and welcome Danielle. Thank you, Mayor. Danielle Sisman, Neighborhood and Development Services. As you introduced, this is an application initiated by the Historic Preservation Commission for the rezoning of approximately uh, 0.45 acres of land from Central Business Service CB2 zone to CB2 with that over overlay zone for historic district protection, uh, making it a landmark. Uh, the property is outlined in white here on the slide. 
and this slide shows the surrounding zoning of the property as well. Um, the purpose of this current zone is to serve as a transition between intense land uses in the central business service district and adjoining areas. Uh, the city council does designate by ordinance areas of the city as historic districts or local landmarks. Uh, the process is done through a rezoning and the application of an overlay zone. Uh, with the proposed rezoning, the property would still retain that base zoning of CB2, but then be given an overlay for the historic district. As a result of the rezoning changes to the exterior, the building will be required to go through historic review process, which is a multi-tiered process depending on the extent of the exterior change, ranging from a staff approval alone to a staff approval with the uh, chair of the Historic Preservation Com Commission or full review by the Historic uh, Preservation Com Commission. Landmark st status will also make the property eligible for special exceptions from the Board of Adjustment. Those special exceptions are designed to waive or modify certain zoning requirements that other properties have to comply with uh, because the property has, is, is historic um, to help support the continued use of historic buildings in general. Landmark designation will also make it possible for financial incentives such as tax credits to be uh, applied for and for the Iowa City Historic Preservation Fund uh, funds to be available for the property. The Slazek Hola building is a remarkably well-preserved example of commercial Italianate architecture. The building was built and operated by Joseph Slazek for 25 years, and when it was run, and then it was run by his son-in-law. Joseph Holub. As originally built, the building consisted of the two-story portion on the corner that included, included two stores on the first floor, with a saloon and dining hall accessed around the corner from Lynn Street. The second floor was the fraternal hall with dance floor stage and a balcony. The three-story building behind was a boarding house. Along the alley, a carriage house and had laundry and sleeping rooms on the upper floors. And adjacent to the carriage house on the east was a stable and feed barn. By 1920, the boarding house was running as a hotel and the stable was converted to a garage. Later, in about 1930, Holub re remodeled the hotel and hall into apartments, creating a large storage attic and a vaulted space above the former, former National Hall. The former stable garage became a laundromat in 1958, and the Pizza Palace, or Polly Ice Pizza, moved into the grocery space in 1969. The building features two base storefronts that were remodeled 55 years ago for the Pizza Palace Poly Eyes use. Um, above the signboard that covers the storefront transom area, there is a mid-level bracketed cornice with dentils below narrow round arched windows with brick hood molds. The upper portion of these windows uh, were clo closed with beadboard at the time of the 1930s remodel. The building is topped by a heavy bracketed cornice and Baroque pediment which, that is similar to architectural details found in 19th century Central European architecture, which would have been familiar to the builders of this building, uh, the Bohemian immigrants that uh, initially per, uh, constructed the building. The saloon entrance off Lynn Street was bricked in at some point and a single window was also bricked in. The three-story hollow apartments has a di decorative pr projecting entrance, likely from the 1930s remodel as well, and more decorative cast hood molds over the windows and more elaborate cornice and, um, and brackets are uh, evident on the building. The carriage house is a simple brick building with synthetic siding on the south wall and mid-century two over two horizontal light window sashes. The laundromat is a brick building with a large gable and sliding stable door, evident on the alley side, and large Baroque pediment on the street facade. I'll just give you a little background about historic preservation in Iowa City in general. Um, Prior to 1992, which was the adoption of the city's first historic preservation plan, much of the historic preservation was kind of a piecemeal affair, um, reactionary at times to challenges uh, to uh, specific buildings, uh, often relying on the national program rather than any local uh, ordinances. Um, really, in 1996, the first landmarking of individual properties began after the 1992 adoption of a strategic plan, which outlined the mission and goals of historic preservation work. Um, there were 36 landmarks designated after 1996 um, when um, that landmarking really uh, ramped up. There was not a, initially a local landmarking process as part of that adoption in the early 80s of the um, historic preservation approach. Um, in two, 2015, um, there was a work plan list of priority properties for future landmarking. Um, that list was uh, building on those 36 initial landmarks. The 36 initial landmarks were uh, properties that had already been um, identified a, a, 
um, eligible for the National Register, so they had a, quite a bit of history behind them and, and were easy to landmark. The 2015 list would, was a list that was created for properties not already designated or, or recognized by the National Register. That means they need to have additional uh, information found out about them and documented in order for them to be landmarked. Um, the first round of properties from that 2015 work plan were uh, beginning to be designated in 2018. Uh, the first uh, round of properties that were undertaken for survey and um, rezoning were primarily buildings that were constructed of brick and initially residential at their early construction. Um, in 2023, the property uh, subject to tonight's rezoning was listed for sale in mid-September. In early October, the Historic Preser Preservation Commission uh, did discuss at a meeting, uh, proceeding with the landmarking of that property. It was a property that had been identified in 2015, but not, not made it through the work plan yet to be landmarked. In October, late October, um, after that HPC meeting, a letter was sent to the owner requesting a meeting with them to let him them know about the uh, interest in landmarking the property and to uh, describe the process that that would entail and, and uh, the effects of that. In early December, staff and the chair of the Historic Preservation Commission did meet with the owner and then did follow up with a e mail and email again about that process. In January, um, the application for historic uh, rezoning, overlay rezoning was applied for by, as I said, the Historic Preservation Commission, and they held their public hearing on February 8th, at uh, which time they did uphold and recommend approval of an overlay zone. Um, the way this works is that then recommendation does progress to the Planning and Zoning Commission, which held a meeting on the 21st to also uphold, recommend um, a rezoning. And correspondence was sent to the property owner after all of those touch points. So the role of the Historic Preser Preservation Commission, I said, is to conduct a public hearing on the rezoning and to review and evaluate the historic significance of the property. The Historic Preservation Commission did determine that the property met the required criteria for landmark designation and that it is significant for its role in the ethnic and commercial history of Iowa City's north side neighborhood and, as I said, a well-preserved example of Italianate architecture. And again, on that, on that Feb early February meeting, they did vote unanimously to recommend approval of the designation. And this slide does highlight the four criteria that the um, historic survey information about the property um, could verify um, met the criteria of the landmark designation requirements. So the landmark designation is a zoning overlay, as I've said, and therefore requires recommendation from the Planning and Zoning Commission to the City Council. The Planning and Zoning Commission's role is to review the proposed designation based on its relation to the uh, criteria that include um, uh, compliance with the comprehensive plan and um, any proposed public improvement plans that might be for the same area. And this slide does show that there's clear um, support in the 20. I see 2030 plan for uh, historic preservation. Um, there's several explicit goals contained in there uh, identifying protection of historic buildings and identifying historic resources significant to Iowa City's past. Uh, this particular property is also located in a district plan area, the Central District Plan, uh, which also does include goals and objectives that are in support of the local landmark rezoning and em emphasizes the historic character of this neighborhood. Uh, the Historic Preservation Plan is the implementation of a lot of, a lot of those goals and objectives. Um, it does uh, identify um, historic resources and that the ongoing identification and protection of those resources is a goal of the city. Um, when, while that's specifically included in the Northside Historic District shown here in blue, this particular property um, was specifically discussed therein as promoting preservation of architectural elements significant to that neighborhood and, and specifically lists this property. So here we are at the uh, step of uh, conducting the review for rezoning. Uh, typically I show you the slide with some other steps for annexation and rezoning a subdivision. In this case it was just be a rezoning. And based on the applicable review criteria, staff recommended designation as a landmark 
to the Historic Preservation and Planning and Zoning Commissions. As I said, the Historic Preservation Commission reviewed the application at its February 8th, 2024 meeting and did recommend approval of the landmark designation unanimously. The Planning and Zoning Commission then at their February 21st meeting found that the proposed rezoning supports the goals of the comprehensive plan and the applicable subdistrict plan and also recommended approval by a vote of six to one. Um, uh, late, earlier today, I believe a uh, protest petition was submitted by the owner and has been verified as valid. So that is on file and that would uh, change the vote and I'm sure the city attorney can walk you through that when you get to it. And that concludes my report. I'm happy to answer questions. Um, the owner, I believe, is present as is the applicant. <laughs> I do have a question relating to um, the criteria for the landmark designation. So where it says possesses integrity of location, design, setting, materials, and workmanship. So there's been some renovation to this building. I guess my question is how does that fit into the whole gamut of making this a historic um, rezoning this to be a historic sure. property. So that's a criteria that's used by the Historic Preservation Commission to make their recommendation. It's not a criteria for the rezoning necessarily, but it was included in your packet. Uh, basically, when a property is studied for the purposes of deciding whether it's appropriate to be landmarked, they uh, hire, uh, a historian is hired and they do a thorough research of the history of the property. It's entirely appropriate that buildings change over time and that those changes can be part of its historic character. So simply not being original doesn't disqualify a building from being historic. So all of those changes over time that might accumulate are actually just as valid as the original construction. Okay, and then because it, when there is, should this be, renovated in the future? Or are there any things that the commission um, could require right now uh, for this building in any fashion? Sure, when the overlay zoning is applied, um, the building does not have to be changed be just simply because of the designation of the rezoning. Um, it's only at what point the, the future owner, the current owner decides to make a change that it has to be reviewed. And those are the changes that, that get reviewed for historic review purposes. So, and it has to be exterior. It wouldn't be an interior change. And it would be reviewed to the historic preservation guidelines that are adopted guidelines for the city. So um, there's nothing that necessarily has to be changed simply because the rezoning applies, but it does uh, affect all future projects um, needing to be reviewed towards those guidelines. So is it fair to say that if someone, uh, because on this building there's, um, I don't know if it was an entry door, an old entry door, is it fair to say that that, if the owner never wants to change any of that area, that, and maybe change something different, that that is grandfathered in as something that they sure. couldn't come in. Typically when we do a historic review, we're only looking at what the applicant has proposed to us and whether what they're proposing to us needs to meet the guidelines. We don't look at larger areas of, of the building and require retrofits of things that they were not intending to change. Okay. Um, I don't have the specific guidelines in front of me for doors and windows, but sure. the typical approach is not to add pro things into their project that they weren't uh, proposing in the first place. Thank you. Here are no other, no other questions. I uh, wanted to know if the applicant is present and want to speak. Okay, hello, welcome. Good evening, counselors. Um, my name is Jordan Sellergren. I'm the chair of the Historic Preservation Commission. Um, others will speak tonight about the historic significance, economic value, and environmental factors in relation to preserving 302 to 316 Bloomington Street, but I'm here to speak about the process of applying historic landmark zoning. As you know, the Historic Preservation Commission has been appointed by you, City Council, to advise on matters of historic preservation, and as spelled out in city code, you've given us the responsibility to uh, promote the educational, cultural, economic, and general wel welfare of Iowa City by protecting historic landmarks, to safeguard the city's historic, aesthetic, and cultural heritage by preserving historic landmarks, to stabilize and improve property values by conserving historic properties, 
to foster civic pride and the legacy of beauty and achievements of the past, and to protect and enhance the city's attraction to tourists and visitors, and thereby support and stimulate uh, business. So these reasons are why we're here tonight. As assigned by the City Council, we've done our work and have identified that 302 to 316 Bloomington Street is a property worthy of historic landmark zoning. The Planning and Zoning Commission agrees and has recommended that you approve landmark zoning to fulfill the vision of the comprehensive plan as saving this property is in the best interest of our community. Your professional staff has found that landmark zoning is consistent with the city's plans and recommends approval. And as you saw um, in the agenda, 30 Northside business, o business owners have co-signed a letter in support of the landmark designation because they recognize the economic and cultural value that 302 to 316 Bloomington Street uh, brings to the neighborhood. So some have said that the Historic Preservation Commission shows up at the last minute to try and save buildings after plans are announced for their demolition. That is not the case here. Going back as far as the 1980s, the Historic Preservation Commission has made at least three attempts to include this property in a historic district or give it a historic zoning status. These attempts failed because previous city councils did not have the political will to do so um, to protect this building when there was not a looming threat. Now that it is in real danger, of p potential demolition. It is up to this city council to do what is called for in our comprehensive plan um, and protect this gem in our community. The state of Iowa and the courts, including the US Supreme Court, have granted you the authority to use our city's zoning ordinance to do just that, to prevent demolition of significant landmarks, such as the one at 302 to 316 Bloomington Street. The courts recognize that the value in this property does not just come from private investment, but that we, the public, and the city have also contributed to the value through public streets, water, sewer service, uh, police and fire protection, basically all of the public infrastructure and services that make the North, uh, North Side Marketplace a commercial success. Um, some will also say that historic landmark designation is not fair to the property owner because it places restrictions on the property, but in fact, zoning restrictions already exist on this property as they do on every property in Iowa City, in this case under the current central business service zone. Um, historic landmark designation actually provides incentives and allows the city to waive certain zoning requirements and to transfer development potential to other properties. Um, historic designation also makes the property eligible for federal and state tax credits that would could make it more profitable. This is a positive alternative to tearing it down. Sending valuable materials to the land, uh, landfill, this is an environmental issue. Uh, preservation is considered to be an environmental issue. Um, and replacing it with an expensive new structure um, that has housing that is possibly not as affordable as the current housing, at the loss of this beautiful building and the history of immigration and community that it represents. Mr. Scarda and his ancestors before him have built and maintained a beautiful and useful property in this community, one that currently provides space for a beloved Iowa City restaurant, an essential service laundromat, and 16 affordable apartments. We understand that he has made the decision to sell. We do not wish to prevent him from selling the property and uh, receiving a fair price. But designating the property as a historic landmark may actually make the, prop uh, the property more marketable as historic st uh, status includes incentives such as zoning waivers and tax incentives. Um, the Historic Preservation Commission was appointed to advise on matters of historic preservation and we, along with the Planning and Zoning Commission and city staff do so advise that this property at 302 to 316 Bloomington Street is one of Iowa City's few remaining examples of architecture from this time. Um, we believe that it should be designated and protected as a local historic landmark. And I would say that now is the time before it's gone forever. And I would like to now turn this over to Historic Preservation Commissioner Deanna Tumman to speak uh, about the environmental benefits of preservation. I think before you leave, are there any questions for Jordan? Um, I had one, and it was based on something that you had mentioned. Sure. But I'm not sure if this is. Let me know if I'm. I'll do my best to answer. Yeah. Sure. So you mentioned that um, one of the things that can uh, an incentive for this is um, uh, is that there can be zoning waivers. Can you explain that just a little bit? I'm thinking of the Del Rey. Is that a, a 
I'm, I can't speak to that, but I do know that speak to um, what I just asked. That please. you know, uh, like grandfathering parking restrictions and things like that, um, not requiring new parking uh, that would be required for new development. Um, there's also the um, uh, uh, transfer development potential, so that uh, a certain amount of square footage that's preserved in a, uh, preserve in, uh, in a existing building could be transferred to other properties. Um, to allow for more space in a new development. So by preserving, you can actually expand uh, into a larger property and create more space in a new, in a new development. So that would, those would be two examples of... Okay. of yeah, that works for me. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And then one question I have is you mentioned that previous council um, didn't have the political will mm -hmm. to designate this as a historic property. Can you just speak to that a little more? Sure, yeah, I do have some notes on that. Um, so in the early 80s, uh, the, uh, there was a proposal to create a, large, a larger historic dis, uh, district which failed at city council. Um, in the 90s, another attempt was made and failed. And then th there, I believe there was a letter drafted to the owner um, which was then removed from the outgoing mailbox in 2015 because uh, it was not advised that council vote on landmarking during an election year. So, thank you. <laughs> thank you. All right, that's all. Thank you. Thanks. Um, another commissioner. As, as part of the commission, is DNA able to go or should? So. I, I guess if you all are part of the applicant and you want to give some more comments, please come. All right, thank you. And I will also say if some of this has already been covered by staff, because we also have the owner and we also want to listen to residents. Absolutely. Great. Welcome. Hello. Uh, my name is Deanna Thoman. And as Jordan mentioned, I'm on the Historic Preservation Commission and I represent the North Side neighborhood on that commission. Um, tonight, I do want to uh, read some words from Lou Tassinary. He had hoped to be here tonight. Um, this does kind of represent the view of the Historic Commission. Uh, so in a recent article arguing the case for adaptive reuse, Alex Garrison stated the following. The built environment is an archive of culture and history. It manifests the aspirations and needs of a society in a particular time and place, creating a record of who we are. It is undeniable that the Slezic Holub Skarda building embodies the knowledge, skills, and sweat equity of not only Bohemian immigrants to Iowa City, but also the multi-generational stewardship of the Slezic Skarda family. Equally important, it embodies the physical energy required for its construction. Historic properties offer unique opportunities to contribute significantly to this city's sustainability goals. They preserve the energy already embodied in the existing building and eliminate the expenditure of additional energy for new construction. Many construction experts consistently estimate that even a new, green, energy efficient building that uses a large percentage of recycled materials would take many decades. That's many decades to recover the energy lost in demolishing a comparable existing building. So put simply, the most sustainable building is the one that you do not have to build. The greenest building is the one that already stands. The adaptive reuse of iconic older buildings simultaneously honors heritage, reduces the need for new construction, and creates the opportunity for creative architectural design and the support of local craftsmanship through adaptive reuse. The physical and cultural history of this site has economic value that will ultimately be enhanced, <coughs> not diminished, by formally acknowledging, acknowledging its importance to the community. <coughs> 
I urge the City Council to unanimously agree with the recommendations of both the Historic Preservation Commission and the Planning and Zoning Commission to grant the Poly I Building landmark status. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, not hearing any. Is the owner here? Okay. Would you like to speak? Welcome, please state your name. Yes, my name is um, Gary Scarta. I'm the owner of uh, the Hollow Apartment Building. It's been in my family for five generations. I'm the fifth. And thank you for signing in. I'm here today to obviously oppose the um, rezoning of my property. Um, uh, first of all, I want to congratulate uh, the Lady Hawks and uh, Lisa Bluter uh, to make the Final Four and hopefully two more games to bring the championship back to Iowa City. That would be great. But. Now, you know, obviously I can't do the things that I once was able to do. You know, I've had health issues. I had an amputation on my right leg. And so uh, it's, it's a very, very expensive. I, mean, I was, you know, I did the plumbing, I did the electricity, I did, a, did most things, certainly. And, um, and saved a lot of money by doing that. But unfortunately, I'm unable to do that right now. I have a manager on the premise, and uh, but um, but anyway, I decided obviously I was going to sell the property. Uh, it's um, a lot of memories, obviously, that I have. But uh, if if I get the money that I certainly think I should get, uh, then I have to sell it to a developer. And you're not going to be able to develop that uh, that zone uh, if uh, if it's um, uh, if it's uh, put on the historic registry. And uh, you know, a developer. I mean, it would be main. It would it would it would bring more tax revenue into Iowa City. And obviously, Iowa City needs a lot of money to support their programs. And uh, I just received my tax bill here the other day, and several, several thousands of dollars more than I paid last year for the property, which is a joke, to be honest with you. Uh, I know people complain about high rents in Iowa City, but they should also complain about uh, high taxes for those people that own that property. Um, you know, it's uh, there's uh, there's a lot of maintenance that's involved uh, to uh, maintain an old building that way. Uh, there's a lot of maintenance. There's um, you know, obviously the utility costs have increased considerably. Um, there's a lot of inflationary pressures right now on the economy, and and yet now I get a high tax bill. A high tax bill to go along with the, uh, with everything else, and um, you know it's I'm I'm confined that that I don't have anything larger than a one bedroom uh, apartment. I have uh, studios and one bedrooms, single people living there. They're not several people living in the same occupied space. That's um, uh, where you can get three or four rents. It's one rent per apartment. So I'm, you know, I'm certainly limited to, um, to the rent, obviously, to, uh, you know, pricing myself basically out of the market. 
because I had just had a gentleman uh, um, a year ago that uh, moved out. He was a very good tenant of mine, but he decided to live with some other people where he can save some money rather than live alone. And yet the city of Iowa City, again, you know, they just, uh, they literally raised uh, my taxes several, several thousands of dollars. And, you know, I'm limited in terms of parking. Um, I have street parking. Um, half of that street was metered uh, several years ago because of a corner business that needed the parking. So they used my, lot, my uh, block to, uh, to put meters in, which again reduced the amount of parking that I have at, the, um, at my building. Uh, because you can't just go out every, every hour to feed the meter, you know, when you're in, in, your, in, your, in your apartment. So, you know, it's... Uh, <clears throat> so, but the best thing that I can do, certainly, I mean, they're, they're, they're redeveloping the south, uh, south side of Lynn Street, South Lynn. Uh, they're developing that. And uh, there's no reason why I can't uh, have a developer come in to develop, put condos or whatever. Um, they can get three or four bedroom condominiums. It's certainly doable. It's, um, there's, uh, um, there's no reason to, uh, to inhibit growth of this community based on based on a building that takes a lot of maintenance. Um, I think a lot of this has to do with Poly Ice Pizza because many people know the building because of Poly Ice Pizza. Um, you know, they've been in the building since 1969. And, um, you know, I was 13 years old when they came in. And, uh, but, you know, they would certainly have an opportunity to stay in that location in a new building. Um, it's very, very simple. And uh, um, the fact that, you know, it's private property. It doesn't belong to the city. It belongs to me and, and certainly my family. And uh, for the city to come along and say, or the Historic Preservation Committee or whatever, to say that I cannot um, do anything with my property because it's historic. Is, is a joke, to be honest with you. And um, uh, like I say, I just, uh, I need to, uh, you know, I've been in contact with some developers myself, my real estate agent, and so on, and, um, but they can't make a move when the decision is, well, it's gonna be historic, so they can't do anything, they can't develop the property. And uh, it, it handicaps me from a personal standpoint. Um, and like I say, it is private property, and I should be able to do with what I want to do with the property. So, any questions? <laughs> I guess I have a question for you. Uh, you spoke about the barking that had been taken you mean like before that the parking belonged to the building, kind of, or can you just speak more about that? The, the black parking lot there adjacent to the uh, apartment building uh, is poly eyes and laundry parking. And um, unfortunately my tenants are not obligated to uh, park there. They do have the opportunity to spend you know, uh, an additional amount, obviously, parking across the street in the Poly Eyes uh, parking lot across the street. And, uh, and that's additional amount of money because, I mean, they pay taxes on that, uh, on that lot. And so they're going to uh, charge my tenants a, a certain fee, monthly fee. And, and how many apartments are there? So most of my most of my tenants park along the street area. It's a lot more difficult now because of the fact that half of the street was metered. I was against that. 
Um, Are you referring to? To look into it and so on, because they, they decided to meter the that part of the. We basically compromised. They uh, they elected the um, on the uh, e on the, on, the, on the west side of the of Lynn Street. They decided not to meter that, so they they metered it on the uh, east side of Lynn Street. Uh, it goes up half, probably halfway up the block, because of a business that's catty corner to my building, and um, <laughs> you know it's. Uh, it was kind of ridiculous uh, to do that because then that reduced the parking um, more more than what it should. Um, and generally, it was odd and even anyway. It was odd, and odd. You know, one side was odd, the other side was even, and uh, the day so they had to move the car from one side to the next. But that's still better than have half of the street metered where they're not able to park there until at least after six o'clock uh, in the evening. So it's, uh, you know, parking's always been limited there. Obviously, it's limited most places around town. And uh, it's, uh, it is a hassle. So she asked another question. Yeah, I asked like, how many apartments do you have in this building? You said one bedroom and studios? Yeah, one bedroom and studios. How many of each? Fifteen. Fifteen apartments. Uh, and uh, uh, my, my largest, I have four large apartments, which includes a dining room as well as a living room, kitchen and bath, and one bedroom. I have four of those apartments. Um, and, uh, and they're very adequate to, f to have two people living there. I've had couples living there. <coughs> But um, other than that, it's, uh, um, you know, it's just very, um, uh, you know, the, the apartments are small. You know, obviously studios don't even, even have a bedroom. They just have a, a living area, kitchen and bath, and, um, and, and, and really this one person can really only live there. Councilor Dunn, very, very different question? for two oh. people. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions by council? Thank you. Okay. okay. Thank you. I have a question for the historic representation people. Yeah. Sure. That? Yep. N thank you. Okay. You can ask your question now. Yeah, my, my question, when, when somebody agreed to preserve a building, uh, what benefit come, out, come with that? Uh, people are complaining about old being, building, like need like a lot of maintenance mm -hmm. and, and all this. You know, can you just tell me what, if I preserve my building, what benefit I'm getting? Sure. Um, well, there's a 20% uh, federal tax credit, I believe, for any... Um, restoration work and then a 25% state Iowa tax credit, so a total of 45% um, federal and state tax credit going toward work done on the property that uh, is that does have a landmark status. Yeah, and can you tell me what that means? Well, that basically means that any, uh, that money you invest into improvements, updates, you know, all which would go through the Historic Preservation Commission, but any uh, money that you invest, you would get 45 cents back for the dollar through uh, state and federal credits. But they have to have money to like do that first. As with so. any renovation, yeah. But there is an opportunity to actually get quite a bit back, whereas, you know, if uh, for a non-landmark property, that would not be a, a possibility. So in many ways, it does actually, in that way, it does actually heighten the, you know, economic value of it, because the owner would be able to make um, a percentage of that back through tax credits. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, well, I might have a question that I don't know if it's for you. 
or somebody else with historic preservation. Um, when a designation comes, does that affect, and, and I'm trying to remember back to an issue we had here just a couple of meetings ago, uh, exteriors only, or does that affect the yep. interiors, like where the apartments and things like that would Our be? jurisdiction is exterior only, so any work done on the inside would not go through our review process. And then if work is done on the inside, that's just a regular renovation, but the stuff that could apply for the tax credits would be the external. Mm -hmm. I believe that's the case, yeah. And, and I, I there, uh, Jessica's historic preservation staff and knows way more about this oh, stuff okay. than I do. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Welcome, state your name. Jessica Bristow, I'm the historic preservation planner. And um, to answer your question just a little bit more, we mm -hmm. do have the ability for a developer or owner to get state and federal tax credits. And those tax credits can actually um, include work on the interior of the building. They can sometimes include carrying costs and other things for a rehabilitation project. In addition, we have our historic preservation fund where we can use that to help a, an owner do repairs to their building. We also have, um, well, we provide sort of uh, design-related services as well. Um, uh, if they want to do some kind of a rehabilitation or make changes to the building. And in general, the property values do tend to be more stable in a historic district or an area that has been designated. But have you educated the people who uh, you ask them to res be reserve their building about all this benefit? Do you guys know about that? That's what I'm asking. Yeah, all of the information that we have provided to the owner does talk about the benefits for landmarking. And we also do, um, I mean, regularly when I talk to owners about work that they want to do on their building, I always mention our historic preservation fund. And if they have a project that might be eligible for tax credits, we also communicate that to the owners as well. Our goal is outreach and information to owners about all of the t types of programs that might benefit them. I think the city just sent letters to that are to everybody who lives in an historic district about what the rules are and what the funding streams are. Yeah, I'm, I'm just like really uh, have a concern about if I'm old, like owning a, an old bu building, but I no longer have money to keep it up, and I, I, I how I'm gonna just survive. Uh, with that, because I just want to make it historic preservation. Mm -hmm. If the city wants something to be historic, mm -hmm. they should really do something very good. Like we ask, in, we we go to people business and we ask them to do this to fulfill our historic preservation goals. Mm -hmm. Then we need to do something. And we do. City Council has implemented our Historic Preservation Fund, and it has been very popular. We would love to increase it if we could. And uh, we do that in order to help people with the repairs. In addition, when people make those repairs, instead of replacing, that money for that repair stays within this community. They are not going and buying windows that are manufactured in Ohio and trucked in. They are using people who work in our community and our state who can repair those materials and so that money stays within our community. And so historic preservation is not only about saving the building, saving the materials, but also keeping that work so that we are paying people in our community. We're not contributing to greenhouse gases and emissions and making plastic products and vinyl products. We are fixing the wood materials that are priceless now because they're no longer available. Historic wood is much stronger than the wood that is harvested now. It has a tighter grain, it's more insect and water resistant, and it will last forever if it's maintained. And so historic preservation is about helping those property owners to not only know how to do that work, who can help them, but also we do try to fund their projects whenever possible. I think all you said is very good and amazing. But again, uh, to the question of Sean, who said, you, you said you provide some time money for maintenance. Is this maintenance for the interior or exterior? Our funds would only be for the exterior. 
the state tax credits and federal tax credits could also be related to the interior. At the same time, we don't regulate the interior. So if they did want to carpet things or replace things on the interior, we are not restricting them in any way. Whether or not the building is designated does not impact, impact the interior of the building. It will prevent it to, from being demolished, but if they wanted to renovate and even change the layout of the interior, we would not restrict that. Yeah, the problem is keeping up, uh, like with old building, it cost, it's costly. Was there, you know, maybe the outside is very good looking, but always the thing that's really go bad is the inside. And uh, I don't know, maybe you guys should think about helping people for the inside too. And it's still the exterior, like how, how often people can execute the exterior. And yeah, I live in my house and I don't think I'm gonna gain anything outside, mm -hmm. but I'm constantly changing things inside. There are housing rehab programs within our community that also can work within, uh, work with interior projects. In fact, frequently, I work with the housing rehab people to come together to help fund a project so they can help with the match to our historic preservation fund and they can also help with that interior work that um, that we just can't help with. And, and part of the reason we can't help with the interiors is because we don't regulate that. That's all my questions, thank you. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna open up this for uh, public comment. I wanna see how many individuals want to speak on this topic. And if you're online, please raise your hand as well. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, about 10. Okay, I count 10, we're gonna go for three minutes. And I, um, there are name, um, stickers in the back if you want to pre-write your name and drop it in the basket. I highly encourage people to do that. Um, we'll ask you to come forth and give your name and city you're from. And I also want to mention that the council cannot engage in discussion or debate until the appropriate time for council discussion. However, once the commenter has left the podium, council may ask staff to respond to a concern or a question posed by the public or to follow up with the speaker. Um, so at this time, we will ask for uh, those that raise their hands and want to speak to come forth. Please state your name and city you're from. Welcome. Hi, thank you. I'm from um, I'm from Iowa City, and I'm Jenna Lee Swain, <coughs> and I'm on the board of Friends of Historic Preservation. <coughs> Excuse me, and uh, want to thank you for this public hearing and to the Scarta family for all their many years of good stewardship. This is important building tells more about the 19th century immigrant story in Iowa City than almost any other building in town. We all have immigration stories, some from our ancestors centuries ago, some from recent lived experience. Tonight's story is about the Bohemians, now we would call them Czech. In the 1850s, they escaped hard times and oppression, came to eastern Iowa, and by 1873, three 3,000 Bohemians lived in Johnson County. The first Bohemian language newspaper in this state was launched here in Iowa City. For many years, it was printed here. And in 1875, Bohemian immigrant Joseph Slazik opened this fine brick building. Uh, the slides, oh goodness. Freeze my time, please. Okay, <laughs> I don't think we can freeze the time. What does it state? Um, can. Oh, okay. Like that. <laughs> Lisa oh, Bluter, time out. Mm hmm Yes. <laughs> Is it this? Uh, next one? You can just oh. hit the... Here, here we are. And I'll grant you an extra 15 seconds. I appreciate that. Yes. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, where was I? 
So Mr. Slazik opened this fine brick building. Its Italian de details are especially well preserved, and as someone else mentioned, the unique feature is this Baroque-style pediment on the top, which you would expect in Prague, but not in Iowa. The building joined our growing commercial scene, especially at first for the hundreds of Bohemians in Goose Town. Advertised as a farmer's home, it attracted farmers who came into town on business, and then who needed a place to eat, stable their horses, and maybe spend the night. Called National Hall, the name on the pediment was also in Bohemian. Mr. Slazik celebrated the opening with a grand ball and four and 400 guests in the second floor social hall, which had a vaulted ceiling and surely a good dance floor because it was used for decades. Bohemian lodges and social clubs met here, helping members in tough times, expand, explaining U.S. laws and keeping native customs. Bohemian was heard throughout the building because in an earlier Iowa City, English was not the only language spoken. Today, Bohemian Czech surnames are still familiar. Shimik, Hayek, Selik, Novotny, Sedlicek, Chadma, Dvorak. Now, in the 19th century, we don't know whether Czech uh, or Bohemian immigrants faced discrimination. We hope not. We do know that by 1920s, federal immigration laws were re restricting immigrants from Eastern and Southern European. And in I, I, other things are changing in Iowa City. In the 20th century for this building, lodging for Bohemian farmers became apartments for college students. The livery stable became a garage and then a laundromat. <coughs> grocery stable, grocery store became a pizza restaurant. Now, look back 150 years ago, though. We had numerous hotels, social halls, eating places, and grocery stores. But note that this one building still standing, still recognizable, served all these functions. No other local landmark tells the immigration story this extensively. This is where the Bohemian immigrants first found community as they prepared to join the larger society. We can do better at saving all immigrant stories. And that's your time. Old and new, let's start here. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Welcome. Hey, um, my name is Willie Oxley. I am an architectural woodworker in Iowa City. It is my job to repair and restore old homes. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about this building and about the nature of using old buildings instead of choosing to do new construction. Um, I am a descendant of craftspeople in Iowa. I am one of those Bohemians that they were talking about. My grandmother came over here on a boat. Um, this is the legacy that my, uh, my ancestors left for me. And history aside, like the nature of these buildings is incredibly intricate and beautiful. And not only that, but it's considerably more environmental than new construction buildings often are. Um, the costs associated um, both economic and environmental with the destruction and demolition of a building, and then the costs associated with the environmental impact of a construction site in a historic district. In a city center, you're releasing tons of dust and paint and debris, and you're burning thousands of gallons of diesel fuel. And I, I, I think it's absolutely senseless because these buildings were designed to be repaired um, and repair is something that we don't think about anymore, and I think that it is probably the number one issue that we face as a country is our decision to say, oh, it's old, it needs this considerable cost. Well, there are all these new, these new ideas and concepts behind construction that we can adopt in these old settings that make things more economic, that make things more accessible to the purveyors of the property or whatever the word is. Um, and yeah, I, I, I can't even believe that we're having this conversation, you know, because my dad talks about going to lunch with, at Paul Glaraz with my grandfather and my great-grandfather. And, you know, it's been such an institution in this town. It's an iconic pediment. It's an iconic set of four windows. You see this view, like this painted mural on the side of the building next to it. You're going to lose that entire skyline. It's part of the skyline of Iowa City. And 
I, 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 don't, I don't know why. I don't know why we're even having this conversation. Um, so, all in the name of profit, as many things are. So I'm going to leave it at that before I get a little bit too long-winded. Um, but thank you for your time. Thank you. And if uh, if people are wanting to speak, I ask that you begin to congregate here. Welcome. Uh, David Woodruff, Iowa City. Yeah, and feel free to get in the line. You're fine. Yeah. Is it historic and is it significant? Trained professionals have said yes. Uh, planning and zoning has said yes. And now you have the opportunity to say yes. Yes, the building brings more value to our community as a historic property than as a redevelopment site. It's now your opportunity to protect it forever, even if the owner objects. Aesthetically, this links the Northside Business District to the Northside Development, uh, Northside Historic Neighborhood, and that's good for business. You all received a letter from the Northside businesses signed by a vast majority of them. The cost of demolition and new construction is far more than preservation, environmentally, culturally, and financially. As was pointed out, this would cause great environmental cost. There would also be extensive cultural cost, as was pointed out, and you got a letter from the Czech Museum as well. There will also be costs to the tenants. Yeah, the commercial and residential tenants will be forced to move, and if allowed to, re to return, the tenant's rent will be higher. Now the benefits. 302 Bloomington may be more valuable if it is marketed as a historic property. The demolition redevelopment buyer will have to pay to tear it down. They'll have to pay to send it to a landfill. They'll have to pay to rebuild. They'll have to pay for barking. Pay, 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 pay. Retaining or renovating will not have these costs. If you designate this property as historic, 45% of the renovation costs can be covered by state and federal tax credits. The Highlander Hotel in Iowa City, Hotel Grinnell in Solon. The developer there, Angela Harrington, pointed out that getting back 45 cents on every dollar is a powerful incentives for redevelopers. There are also uh, city incentives with historical landmark zoning. City incentives. Um, the building has a zoning code if a new building is built. A historic landmark has zoning code waivers. Iowa City code also allows for the sale of development rights to adjacent properties. Additionally, studies have shown that when you use the incentives for historic landmarks, $478 comes back in direct private expenditures and $507 in economic activity. That means for every dollar we spend in historic um, incentives, we get $9.85 back into our economy. We have a finite supply of historic buildings in our community, and every time one is demolished, it is gone forever. You have an opportunity, and your community will be forever thankful. Thank you. Did you state your name and city you're from? David Woodruff, Iowa City. Thank you. And then um, the next speaker, please come forward. And I do ask people to start lining up as the previous speaker is finishing. Thank you. Hi. Um, my name is Roxanne Erdahl. I um, had not planned on speaking. I just moved back to Iowa City after being gone for 20 years. Um, I have some history in the fact that uh, five generations, 1929, my grandparents owned Maid Right, Myers Maid Right on the Pentacrest, right across from the Pentacrest. Um, my dad moved us back in 65 to run it again. I opened a business in 1975 on the Ped Mall called Buck Leathers, and my son opened a restaurant in 2005. So I'm going to talk to you about history and what it means to this community. I took my two grandsons down this summer <clears throat> because I wanted them to know the history of Iowa City. And I think that's part of what we're, we're talking about tonight. We're talking about a building. I'm asking you to also understand that at least um, for my family, you also have a responsibility to hold that history in your heart for us. It meant a lot to me that I could take my grandsons down there and say, this is where your, grand your great grandparents, your great great grandparents first opened a restaurant in 1929. This is where your grandma marched and um, made some history 
and fought for women's rights in Iowa City. Their grandfather, Clemens Erdahl, sat up there where you're sitting right now for eight years. And so there's history here that people are talking about that's just really important, and that's part of your responsibility, is to hold the heart. So that's what I'm asking tonight. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Please state your name as city. Uh, my name is Phil Beck, and I live here in Iowa City. I've been here since 1975. Um, I'd like to add my voice uh, in support of this uh, local historic landmark status for these properties on, on Bloomington Street. I realize that a, a community is made up of individuals and individuals have rights, but I also believe that a community has an obligation to consider the collective good as well. And part of the collective good, I believe, is preserving what has value in the community. And I think aesthetic beauty and history are values, very fragile ones, as some people have commented already. Once you sweep them away, they're gone forever. Um, a building with historical value, if it's eliminated, that history disappears. I mean, it may remain in books, but there's no preservation, there's no evidence of it left. Um, and I, I think it's very significant that um, Slezak Hall was a gathering place for the Bohemian and, and Czech community in Iowa City. It, it, that makes it an important monument to the diverse ethnic history of our city. I'm someone with Czech heritage in his family, and that means a lot to me. In addition, of course, as we all know, the building houses one of uh, Iowa City's most popular and iconic restaurants, Palyais. And this ensures that this building is important not simply for its age or architecture, but because it continues to serve a vital part of the business and cultural life in Iowa City. I enthusiastically support designating it a local historic landmark. I think you have a great opportunity to preserve beauty, history, and value in our community, and I hope you take it. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else want to address this topic? Please come forward. Welcome. Thank you. Hi, my name is Susan Futrell, and I live um, in the nor in the near North Side neighborhood here in Iowa City. Um, you have a letter from my husband and I with some other points, so I won't repeat what I've already said. I think the, some of you who responded to that, um, but I wanted to come in person and say to you directly a couple of additional things about the opportunity you have here. I love the history of my neighborhood and I've been active in trying to help preserve it and take care of our old house and those things, but I truly believe the decision to landmark this property is less about history than it is about the future and the character of our unique community both economically and culturally, and I really want you to think about that in terms of the future. Um, since the, this came before the council the last time, this neighborhood and business district on the near north side has changed considerably due primarily to development that has been of a particular kind that is quicker um, and turns profit more quickly and short term. Uh, putting up tall buildings with apartment buildings that hold multiple students or Airbnbs for the week and uh, f first, first floor rental that, that's sometimes hard to keep active. At the time this came before the council before, that neighborhood was largely intact with buildings that were of a scale suitable to a walkable neighborhood and um, were more, more characteristic of the old history. Now this Palliais building and the laundromat represent one of the few buildings left that really hold that history. And I think by 
looking at other ways to add value and, and take value from that piece of property, you're actually doing something to benefit the entire community, both economically and culturally, not just the Northside neighborhood. So I would urge you to really think about this in terms of an investment for the future and one that can honor the stewardship that the Scarda family has, has taken of that building. They've taken beautiful care of it. Um, and I think it's rare that you have an opportunity as the, as the council to, to make such a significant impact on the future of the community with such a, a small piece of property um, as the one we're looking at tonight. So I urge you to landmark it and help transition it to new ownership that can find new ways of adding value and, and bringing that value to the community. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome, Mr. Mayor and City Council. Um, my name is Jay Honahan. I live at 420 North First Avenue, and I am going to speak against putting this on that historical um, landmark. First of all, as you can see by that picture up there, even though the building was built in 1874, and it was as a dance hall and then the laundry mat was a, a horse stable um, there has been significant changes to the exterior of the building and um, the inside of the building and so since 1875 and so that wouldn't the changes that have been made then it wouldn't apply to putting it on the historical um, landmark and second you know i've been living in iowa city since 64 and um pally ice pizza was not in that present location when i was born it was um on clinton street um where old capitol mall was and it got they moved because um, the city was doing urban renewal back then. And so you should con also consider a business inside of a building does not make it a historical landmark. And then you're limiting Mr. Scarda by selling his place um, to a developer you're probably going to end up losing a lot of tax dollars on by not having it developed and so i'm opposed to putting this on the historical landmark thank you thank Council. you yep i want to see how many uh individuals still want to speak i see two back there and then we have one online i'm going to welcome Three, three still. I'm going to welcome Susan from online. Welcome. Please state your name and city you're from. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Uh, my name is Susan Melliker, and I'm from Iowa City. Um, I'm watching this online, and I am going to have a, again, I'm probably not going to have a popular opinion here. Um, I grew up in the North End. I was born at Mercy Hospital. I lived on Ronald Street. I have eaten a million and a half Polly Eyes pizzas. Everyone in my family has worked at Polly Eyes over the years. Um, and every, every single time that a property owner wants to sell a property um, that may be considered historic, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying it's, this property is not historic, but I'm always bothered by the lack of rights of the property owner. I mean, a pro in this case, you know, I've just listened to the fact that a property owner can get 45% tax credits back for, uh, you know, updates. But someone has to pay the 55%. And if you own a property and you can't afford that 55%, then you can't update that property. And it's, there's so many examples in Iowa City, it's going to be an unpopular thing to say, where the Historic Preservation Commission 
is not interested in a property at all until the owner wants to sell it. And I, I get the redevelopment of Iowa City. I'm 65 years old and I've seen the changes to this community. But I'm always concerned that if I want to sell my house someday, is someone going to come in and say, I'm sorry, you can't sell your house that I've owned for 30 years, that I've updated, that I've taken care of, and that now is probably my biggest asset. And it's, it's always bothered me that no one is concerned about these buildings until an owner wants to sell them. And so that's all I wanted to say tonight is that we do need to proactively approach people who own buildings in historic districts and start to work with them long before they want to put their property on the market. Thank you. Thank you. And welcome to the next speaker. <clears throat> My name is Bob Wise. I live in North Liberty right now, but I was born here in 1950. On the one hand, I have to say that I'm embarrassed to uh, not have known that the area in which the National Building sits is part of the original plot of the city of Iowa City. So its history goes back long before uh, the building was built. Kitty Corner, the parking lot, and then the house to the east of uh, the Poly Ice parking lot. That's where Coonrod Graf, the brewmaster for the Union Brewery, built his house. So if we extend on a line down to John's Grocery, that's about the end of what's left of the original plot of the city of Iowa City, the downtown area of Iowa City. And the buildings are disappearing, not only in Iowa City, but also around the country. And with that, history is lost. Whether it's the Bohemian Czech history, whether it's Native American history, um, I've seen it in Minnesota, I've seen it in North Dakota, I'm all around. And so you don't have an easy task. I, I, I don't envy any single one of you up there. But I do ask that you give serious consideration to eliminating part of the original plot of Iowa City and uh, what the long-term effects will be. In 1965, when this building became occupied, I watched the old fire station up on the corner of Lynn disappear, demolished. I don't remember who tore it down. I can't tell you how exactly it was done. But if we look at it now, it's a parking lot. <coughs> if we go kitty corner to the building that was over you know, opposite of the city hall, that's now a vacant lot. And as far as I know, there's no development which is planned for it. There's a lot of desire for the property within the, the, uh, the area where the national building is at. Um, and at what cost to the history of the city of Rain or the city of Iowa City um, will we render that? Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, my name is Kevin Boyd. I live in Iowa City. Um, local landmarks connect us to both the past by honoring honoring our civic ancestors, uh, what they, our civic ancestors built but it also connects us to the future. It says we value this history and we want Iowa Cityans to be able to experience heritage sites. But I also want to address a few things I've heard tonight that I, uh, I don't know, just I, uh, to add to the conversation. You know, I, I'm no longer on the Historic Preservation Commission, but when I was there, our approach was really trying to be yes and. You know, we partnered with the Iowa City Downtown District to provide um, a framework of incentives for property owners that to opt into historic landmarks to give them tools. Three of you were on the city council when that happened, and uh, you guys declined to take that up. So we've tried. I just want to point that out that we are not always reactive. We try to be very proactive, and, and that didn't happen. And that's fine, but here we are tonight trying to, 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 to preserve this building. 
Um, I also wanted to say to you know that we hear a lot about private property owners and what they can what happens then, but the city regulates private property all the time. Every city, every part of the city is zoned. Every part of it has regulations. Um, and we all deal with those restrictions and regulations and what we do with that property. It's your right to do it, and it, it is part of what we, we all just accept it uh, very often, except for when it comes to historic preservation buildings or buildings of historic nature. Um, and we also hear a lot that, of what might happen of the economic property value. But you guys make decisions all the time that impact people's property values, whether you complete a road, convert a one-way, widening a road, where to build or renovate a park, adding density to a zone, changing the zoning from a property across the street. All those decisions have economic impacts on, on, on people in the community, and you make those decisions regularly. Um, you know, I, um, we've seen examples we've, we, you know, of the state and federal tax credits. We've talked about the history. Um, but I also want to point out that this communication around this has been nearly entirely positive. Citizens are engaged, one of your core values, and in favor of this. Uh, we heard from local businesses loud and clear that preserving this building adds economic value to more than just what's on this lot. Two commissions have passed it overwhelmingly. It's in multiple city plans. City staff recommends it. Um, you know, these plans are part of what the citizens have already told you. Iowa City is telling you to preserve this building. It's time to join its rightful place as an Iowa City local landmark, and I urge you to support the landmark status. Thank you, and we'll have the last speaker come forth at this time. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, I'm Thomas Ager, and I live in the north side. I served as HPC rep for seven years. We aren't talking tonight about landmarking a property as a stretch of the imagination, as we often did when I was on the commission. We're talking about a cherished core property in Iowa City's past, present, and future, inextricable from the story of Iowa City and the North End. We lament the loss <clears throat> of so many historic buildings during, ur during urban renewal, but as far as I can tell since moving here in 2009, urban renewal alive and well. As developers and accountants pencil Iowa City's his history, texture, and unique flavor out of existence in favor of cheap structures built for balance sheets. As you leave tonight, I ask you to look east at the distinctly forgettable three over one across from the co-op. Look west, where a giant hole in the ground stands monument to one Iowa City family's bank account. Or north, where a historic UU church was leveraged and now sits abandoned, having served its role lining private pockets. Don't forget the increasingly dilapidated historic 410 North Clinton wrongly rejected landmarking by council in 2019 and held hostage for development handouts. Or the charming pile of bricks uh, we all woke up to on Christmas morning after a jolly visit from a bulldozer on South Dubuque Street, episodes we can be proud of. I get it, when a property owner disagrees with the historic designation of a building, it is awkward. But as fate would have it, in anticipation of these exact circumstances, <clears throat> we came up with systems and protocols. We have a comprehensive plan, succinct standards historic properties must meet in a process of community representatives at three levels who ensure those guiding documents and standards aren't applied capriciously. So that when our community's history comes under threat, we have an established and agreed way to prevent our historic assets being emotionally leveraged for private gain. We made the rules, and the rules say that we don't have to play that game. This past HPC unanimously, and the one dissenting vote on PNZ wasn't because it didn't overwhelmingly meet the criteria, but because they felt squeamish about the dissent of the owner, which is not supposed to play a role in the analysis or recommendation, and accordingly, we should consider the PNZ vote also unanimous. The property is a bellwether. If we can't use the established process to save what I see as a slam dunk property over the objection of the property owner, how will we ever save downtown where dissenting owners pepper every block? Rulings on individual properties do not set precedent, but if I was a developer, I'd be watching this council's decision closely. You're tasked with putting process over personal. A dissenting property owner does not constitute some kind of Teflon veto. And a super majority vote tonight in the affirmative sends the message that this building in our downtown is not for sale and showing yourself to be a council that values preservation and lockstep gives mandate to the HPC and PNZ to begin protecting downtown in earnest before it's too late. If you're a no vote, I hope you'll show up at the demolition for one last hot slice and a photo op. I urge you tonight to do what is right for the community, honor our agreed upon rules and processes, and tell everybody that this Iowa City Council, that you have the chutzpah to stand up to developers and development, and that you value community character and fair civil process above private gain and tax base. All buildings new buildings require maintenance. Please show that you value a city worth maintaining. Thank you. Thank you. And we're closing, well, before I close public um, hearing, I want our city attorney just to kind of review um, the voting requirements for a supermajority since there are 
Uh, six of us, one of our counselors is not with us tonight. Right, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, that's one of uh, three matters I'm hoping to take up with you before your uh, discussion begins. Uh, the first thing I wanted to mention was uh, just making some record that the mayor pro tem stepped out for uh, a few minutes. This is, this is a planning and zoning matter, so this is an important record to make for religious purposes, but was listening in for the entirety of the hearing uh, while she remained in the adjacent room. Uh, two, uh, procedure vote. Because the uh, protest petition has been filed, um, a supermajority, that is three-fourths of all members of city council, are required uh, for passage. And again, it's not three-fourths of those present, it's three-fourths of the members of the city council. So that would still be six votes in order to uh, proceed. So the informal consensus the mayor would be looking for would be all six present, uh, uh, intending to vote in accordance with planning and zoning affirmative uh, recommendation. If uh, six votes are not present for that, then we would need to uh, keep the public hearing open, uh, defer consideration to the next uh, meeting, and uh, ask for or offer a consult uh, to planning and zoning. Finally, um, I, I want to just make a couple of uh, clarifications as to what's appropriate consideration for council um, in, in such a matter. One, there's been uh, mentioned by a couple of people about the opportunity to transfer uh, development rights. That's true in some form-based uh, code portions of the uh, town, but I don't believe that's present in this part of town. The other is there's been quite a bit of discussion about the environmental impact of demolition and so forth. And while that's certainly true, um, that would be true of any building, historic or not, so that should not be uh, a strong consideration in your uh, debate either. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions about either those legal matters or the procedures. So you, you if, if I may ask, so you said that there are th some, some things that we can't judge it on. Can you yeah. give us a clear picture on what we can judge this uh, proposed law? Oh, sure. All the things that are in the staff report that are, you know, uh, considerations for whether this considered is considered to be historic, um, I, I could pull it out or, or probably. For the, sake of the, for the sake of the room, I'd appreciate it. Well, uh, would you feel comfortable? <laughs> I think that uh, there are a couple staff members who would certainly be better versed than me to offer that, so I'll. Um, yeah. refer to Ms. Sitzman for that. Thank you. Thank you. So just to recap, when the Historic Preservation Commission considered this, the landmarking criteria are the um, and will you, criteria. And will you speak specifically to um, 314, 310, and 316, those addresses? I'm not sure I know what the, that, that oh. what reference that is. What do you? So, uh, that's the laundromat. Oh, the addresses. Okay. Yes. Well, they're all considered one property, so I'm not sure I can yeah. right. them out individually. But the most relevant resource for what whether they meet local criteria A, B, C, D, and E would be what's contained in the historic survey included in your packet, which was conducted by. A, a, qualified historian who researched the history of the property. Um, they documented um, the architectural style and the um, cultural history of the, of the property. They documented all of the things that go into those criterion and found that they did meet them. So I don't know if, that, if you really want me to recount every single element, but they certainly certified that local criterion A, B, C, and E were all met, and that satisfies our ordinance for landmarking. Any other questions by council? Okay. So then, um, essentially, if one person is not inclined to vote with PNZ recommendation, and sometimes that could mean that um, maybe it's, you know an individual is not very set on voting in the affirmative. I just want to state that for the public. Um, that they may want to consult. Um, so I just wanted to ask my fellow counselors if um, people are inclined to vote in accordance with PNZ recommendation. Okay. Can we discuss anything before we answer this question? Well, council discussion is the next portion, but if you have any questions for either staff or uh, well, for staff, um, I'd certainly try to answer them. My question really for the historic preservation. I, uh, 
I want to see like this to be king, like kind of, uh, you know, I think Kevin, you talked about incentive and all this. Uh, I, I just believe that when we go to someone and try to ask them to, re to preserve and they cannot, for example, if I have a historic house, but I'm no longer have money to keep it up. And you designate, and I need money. I need money for my house. I want to do something. I'm going to sell it because that's the only thing that I want. So if we would like to make something aesthetic, I think we need to do more to the person. I understand that you came to the council and it wasn't. To be honest with you, I just try to understand this whole strict things from last time until now. I'm not going to say this is beautiful building. We need to keep it. There is many of them. We need to keep them too. But m my problem is that when the city do something, we need to do extra to the person who own the building. Like, uh, and even if we find out this person really, really need need to sell this building. As a city can buy it, buy it. I'm remarking aesthetic. There is no problem. But I, I really want to, <coughs> I, I'm just torn now. I want this to be preserved. In the same time, I want to see if the staff can, or the historic preservation can do amend, or propose amend, amendment for what they do currently. Because I think it's like, yes, caring about the outside, as I told you earlier, who often came the outside of the building, especially if it's old? That's why I, I, I would like to see, before I can ye ye vote yes or no, I want to hear if that possibility. May I ask a question about staff? Uh, sh sure. I want to make sure I don't you know, blow past uh, the mayor pro tem's question. I, I'm, was that? Did you have a question at the end there? I'm sorry. I want to make. Yeah, sure I, I said answer. I want to know if there is a way we can change this. We can change with the city responsibility when we ask a person to make their own building a historic. <laughs> like, is there is? Can we give them more? Can we change instead of like exterior? Can we do? like help for the interior? Can we help with keeping up the, and like maintaining the building inside? Well, sure, that would be a political decision that, that council would have to make to amend the ordinance to and to provide funding, presumably, for the kind of support that I think you're describing. Is that answer your okay. question? Then, uh, can I ask my fellow council question or no? Uh, no. <laughs> may I ask a staff question? You may. <laughs> this decision today would not preclude us from changing programs in the future to add additional funds or expand the things that the mayor pro tem is talking about. Is that correct? You're correct. That could You could do this rezoning today and then make the kind of changes that I think the mayor pro tem is describing. And, you know. and we could, in fact, potentially direct staff to start investigating how we would change those programs or no? Uh, yes, council could so direct, yes. In this moment. Not in this oh, immediate well. moment, but like... Tonight. Tonight. On the discussion uh, part. Um, yes. Okay. okay. I have a question for historic preservation. Okay. So designating this as a landmark, as has been recommended, does not preclude, doesn't mean that the place can't be sold, correct? Oh, correct. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. If you're going to answer, we need to have you come to the podium. Sorry. I'm sorry. Like, designating this does not mean that the building cannot be sold. It simply is marking it as a historic landmark, yes. and then it is sold to perhaps a different developer That's who correct. is interested in a historic building. Mm -hmm. Right, I can answer that. Subject to its zoning like any other sale. Yes. Yeah. But and it will be sold. While I'm here, may I comment Wait, no, on I'm sorry. Only, no, not while I'm here. You need to only answer yes. questions. I'm sorry. Okay. Maybe one question for Danielle, real quickly. This is a CB2 zone that has requirements for parking. If this was a new building, you would have to have parking. It would also have FAR requirements, so the size of the building would be substantially smaller. And this building, like, if there were a other building to go there, could you describe what's possible? We did do a brief development analysis just based on the premise of new development under just existing zoning. Um, and we did share that with the property owner as well. Um, let me see if I have it. it. Some of the questions earlier about how much parking does it have and things like that went into our review. 
Uh, you know, we don't run a performa though, so right. telling you whether it's priced appropriately on the market or what it might command on the market. Um, but certainly, the standards of CB2 would apply all the current standards, all the current site plan requirements. Um, it's certainly under the potential density for the site under that zoning as it currently is built. The number of units is below the maximum density, but what we typically see is the other constraints on development besides just unit count is providing parking and open space and all of those other things that go into a site development. Right. I think there might be some confusion about transfer development, right, simply because the CB2 does have a little bit of that into it, but it's not based on historic designation. So just to clarify, um, we did look into a, a, a program of transfer development rights in 2019. Um, City Council uh, directed staff to explore that, but ultimately when we advanced a transfer development rights, um, ordinance change, it was not adopted by council. So we've explored that, but we do not currently have transfer development rights anywhere except in the south or the Riverside, Riverfront Crossings form based code. Thanks, Daniel. I have a question for you. So 314, 310, 316, I'm trying to de determine what the historic, you know, attributes of these sites are. Are you referring to the building versus the state? Well, the stable. I mean, we have a, a, a laundromat in there now, and so I, I'm a little confused as to. <laughs> I, I'd certainly get the you know the, the the corner building, but the other properties. How do they historic? That's what it is. It's it's all one property, so the zoning would be applied to the entire property. Okay, and then if someone should come before the council in the future, let's say someone buys it, the council can consider uh, kind of preserving the frontage of maybe some of the property, but not all of it. But that would be a council; uh, it'll go through the the proper channels, but that is a possibility. So if you're thinking of something like the Tailwinds development on the Pet Mall on East College Street, where uh, some redevelopment happened and some preservation also happened, um, if it were rezoned this evening, the entire site would be subject to preservation. Something like that would require rezoning where perhaps the overlay was removed from, again, from part of the lot to allow it not to be part of uh, historic preservation anymore. Keep in mind that the Tailwinds East College Street project was also a TIF project, so we had a development agreement that was negotiated that gave us extra control outside of just regular zoning, so. Uh, we also did it on College Street. Right, right. Where we reserved the, right. the frontage. And that was all one project. Okay. Oh. Okay. Eric, I got another question for you. Um, would would a desire to change another program be grounds for um, denying this request? No. Uh, you would need to vote based on the current state of the law. Thank you. C can you tell me how many how many buildings do you have uh, reserved as historic? Currently, I think of the 2,700 properties in Iowa City, there are 67 landmark buildings. And, and why is this building not being attempts, have, attem okay. attempts have been made, and so this is this is our um, likely last attempt. So this was the third attempt, correct? I believe that this might be the fourth, perhaps even fifth. Oh, you mean, but it never come to us, right? It has come to council, yes. yes, and it's it, it has not. The 1980s. It is, yep, since since 1980, I believe was the first attempt. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So, I'm having issues with this one. <laughs> I am. I'm going to request that we have a consult with PNZ. All right, then you want to keep the public hearing open and uh, I would accept a motion or entertain a motion to uh, defer to uh, date certain. Um, we would do the 16th and, and we can <coughs> revise it April 16th. Okay. 
So could I get a motion to defer till April 16th? Move. Move by Salah. Uh, quick question. This is kind of a fait accompli, right? If we don't have all six of us. Yes. So it has to be deferred at this point, no matter what. Yes. Pretty much, yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, if the informal consensus is you don't have six votes, and that's what I'm hearing from the mayor, then yes, a consult must be offered to P and Z, and thus you need to defer to and, accomplish and that. if the deferral for, like, if nobody agrees for the deferral, what's going to happen? <laughs> Uh, if no one agreed to the deferral? Yes, if it's like now, motion, right, we don't. second, and when we come to vote, it failed. Then we have to vote. Uh, huh. I had not considered that hypothetical. Um, I, I'm not sure why you would do that. If, if those who are opposed to moving forward or aren't confident that they want to move forward that at this point uh, would certainly want to have the uh, opportunity. I mean, the whole point of the ordinance is to allow planning and zoning to come meet with you, answer your questions, address your concerns, or not, you know, uh, but at least have that opportunity. I think it would be inconsistent with the current state of our ordinances for council to, to not defer and thereby not allow that planning and zoning consult. It, can I, it also means, I mean, they're the ones within this discussion that we haven't heard from. So it makes sense to sort of close that circle and and talk to P and Z. Yeah. yeah. So we have a motion by Sala. We need a second. I'll second. Uh, seconded by Alter. And roll call, please. What do we? Oh, this is a deferment. deferment. So yes, on a deferment. It, it, That's what we're. It, it's a deferral. We're voting to defer, and since it's a motion, a roll call is not required. Oh. I'm happy to do that. Okay. If you like that. Yeah. But this would be for the April 16th meeting when we'll have a meeting with PNZ. Yeah. So all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes six to zero. Thanks to everyone for coming out for that one. Yes. Mayor, could we get a motion for the correspondence? Yes. So move. So second. All right, moved by Sala, seconded by Dunn. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes six to zero. Mayor? Can I take like two minutes? Yeah. About five minutes. <laughs> five That's minutes. all right. Yes, yeah, so we're going to take a five minute break and we will return at um, 8.30. City Council is returning from a short break. We're going to move on to item number 9B, which is rezoning 429, 430, 436 through 438, 501 Southgate Avenue, and 916 Waterfront Drive. Ordinance rezoning approximately 4.5 acres are properly located at 429, 430, 436 through 438, and 501. Southgate Avenue and 916 Waterford Drive from intensive commercial zone to community commercial zone. And this is the second consideration as staff has requested an expedited action. Who will have that? And we'll need somebody to read. <gasps> I'll do it. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I know you like to do that. <laughs> All right. Okay. okay. Uh, I move that the rule requiring that ordinances must be considered and voted on for passage at two council meetings prior to the meeting at which it is it be finally passed be suspended, that the second consideration and vote be waived, and that the ordinance be voted on for final passage at this time. Second. Moved by Don, seconded by Sala. Um, and anyone from the public like to address this topic? If so, if you're in person, please step forward. If you're online, please raise your virtual hand. Seeing no one, council discussion. Roll call, please. Dunn? Yes. Harmson? Yes. Mo? Yes. Salah? Yes. Teague? Yes. Alter? Us. Motion passes six to zero. Uh, can I get a motion to pass and adopt? So moved. Second. Moved by Dunn, second by Salah. Uh, roll call, please. Dunn? Yes. Harmson? Yes. Mo? Yes. Salah? Yes. Teague? Yes. Alter? Yes. Motion passes six to zero. Could I get a motion to accept correspondence? So moved. Mm -hmm. oh. I'm sorry, Mayor, that was a mistake on my part. No, no. correspondence. Oh, okay. No, no, no. We're going to go to 9C, 
rezoning 1810, 1816, and 1828 Lower Muscatine Road. This is an ordinance rezoning approximately 6.25 acres of land located at 810, 816, and 828 Lower Muscatine Road from neighborhood public zone to general industrial zone. And this is the second consideration. Can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Moved by Don, seconded by Alter. Anyone from the public like to address this topic? Welcome. Please state your name and city. Good evening. My name is Laura Ruth. I live in Iowa City, Iowa. Um, I have resided in Iowa City off and on for about 50 years, so I predate Poly Eyes. <laughs> My home is about four blocks away from the former Kirkwood campus complex on Muscatine that you all are addressing tonight. I know that you have received dozens of letters against the proposed rezoning, almost all from people, families, residents, and homeowners who live in the neighborhoods that will be most affected by this rezoning. And while some folks have praised the Oral B plant as a terrific neighbor, I see it differently. I'd like to present you all with a couple of photographs that I took just a couple of days ago. I'm gonna give these to the city clerk at the end here so she can put them in the record. This is the front of the Kirkwood building two days ago. 20 plus chemical containers stored outside, out front, right on Lower Muscatine Road. In spite of the fact that the rezoning has not yet been approved, Oral-B has already started storing chemical containers outside. It doesn't bode well for their future compliance with zoning rules. They are, as one neighbor described, too big to care. Oral-B is Procter & Gamble. They are the same company. By rezoning, as proposed, you are giving Oral-B and Procter & Gamble carte blanche to do what they want on this site. Under the current proposal, the setback at the rear of the Oral-B property, as proposed, will be zero feet. Again, I'd like to just give you a little bit of a picture. That yellow part in the middle, that's the zero setback, okay? That means that those of us that live on the other side of the railroad tracks get to deal with whatever they decide to put on that, what is now a parking lot, all the way up to the edge of the tracks. If this rezoning goes through, Oral-B can do whatever it wants on this property. Manufacturing, more buildings, waste storage, truck movement, compressors, condensers, cooling towers, storage tanks, they will be allowed to do whatever they want to do. This proposed rezoning is a terrible idea and it will be impossible to undo it if it is allowed to proceed. To assert, as some city officials have, that the details of future site planning can be worked out and will rectify any problems associated with rezoning, problems such as lighting, setback, or storage is ludicrous. Those remedies rarely occur after the fact. I think we all know that. The city council does or will be no favors by rubber stamping this. If you allow the rezoning to proceed without any conditions or restrictions, you are increasing the likelihood that Oral-B and Procter and & Gamble will be the subject of increasing regulatory scrutiny and citizen complaint. The city's failure to seek real feedback on this proposal is a Thank poison you. pill. And if anyone is online and want to speak to this, please raise your virtual hand. Oh, uh, should we move to receive correspondence? Yeah. Um, could I get a motion to accept correspondence? Second. I move by Don, seconded by Alter. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes six to zero. Welcome. Thank you. Do I need to sign this also? No. No. State your name and city. Hello. I'm Cindy Cochran. I live here in Iowa City. I was born in Johnson County in 1959, January 1st, first baby in Johnson County at Mercy Hospital. I've seen many things in my 65 years, a lot of things downtown. I still refer to the whole place out there where Finn and Feather is as the Wardway Plaza. That's the only way my husband knows how to find me when I'm out there. I am here tonight because I spent the last 20 years of my teaching career at the Iowa City Kirkwood campus. And it's a travesty what Kirkwood did to the people of Iowa City and Johnson County 
taxpayer dollars went into building that beautiful building. Some of you I know have been in there. Some of you were my students. Some of you knocked at my door and asked me to vote for you with beautiful voices. And tonight I have watched many people approach this podium and speak out as public speakers. Because you see, that's what I taught, people to stand up and to speak. And tonight you have a lot in front of you. And I know why I'm never running for city council, but I'm <laughs> glad my students are there and my neighbors. But you must do tonight in every case in front of you what is right. Yes, it must be legal, but you must do what is right and what is humane for the people in this community who are LBGTQ, for the elderly in this community, which I am getting more and more of, <laughs> for everyone in this community to preserve history, to preserve the future, and yes, as you suggested, we as a council, as a community, as a, as a county, we must protect landowners and say, yes, we need to do this to your property, but here's what we can offer you. We must be more proactive. And as was suggested by a speaker earlier in the evening, Johnson County, Iowa City is where I live. I live here because it's the only place in Iowa where I would live, yet I go across Ragbri, I go to the State Fair, and I love people who oppose my ideas that I can talk to, not just have them trash me, because I'm not gonna trash them. And so tonight I ask you, that beautiful building, do not tear that beautiful building down. Those signs for demolition were on those buildings before you even looked at rezoning that area. They're gonna tear those buildings down. Yes, they stepped up, just like the University of Iowa, to preserve that hospital, but they're not the goodness of the people. Save that building and turn it into something else. Force them to. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, please state your name and city you're from. I'm Ann Marie Krause, a 40-year resident of the southeast side of Iowa City. I've got some comments and questions referring back to last meeting in March. The council and the zoning commission have both said that they can't vote against the rezoning because there's no data demonstrating pollution. So using that line of reasoning, why do you think you can vote for the rezoning based on no data? If you require data to vote against the rezoning, you must also require data proving that no additional pollution would result from an additional factory. You do not have this data to prove that no harm would result. Secondly, during the meeting in March, you were right to recognize that there are other sources of smells and pollution in the area. So knowing that, why would you want to add to it? And knowing that, why wouldn't you address these other sources before adding another source to it? <clears throat> Some have said that area traffic is a bigger polluter, but this is a diversion tactic. The same question remains, why would you add to the existing pollution with an existing factory? Third, at the meeting in March, you agreed to discuss air quality in the work session. I looked at the agenda for the work session a few days ago and air quality was listed but as of yesterday, I could not see air quality listed, what happened to it. I hope you still discuss it. Uh, fourth, at the meeting in March, Councilor Harmson stated he couldn't smell anything on the east side. Despite the fact that many residents can and do smell chemicals, please remember that Dr. Buchkina stood here and educated us that the harmful chemicals can be totally undetectable by smell. The absence of smells or the absence of data do not mean the absence of harm. Fifth, we need scientific testing and monitoring all over the east side. City government could make this happen. You have received emails about an Iowa City business that can do it. Sixth, at the meeting in March, Councilor Saleh pointed out that the poor and immigrant residents are mostly unaware of the dangers in this area. They're too busy working multiple jobs or have other immediate concerns. It is your duty to acknowledge the environmental injustice of placing most of the polluting industries among the lower income areas. City councils of the past have run roughshod over the southeast side. 
This does not mean that the current council needs to continue this shameful practice. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Please state your name and city you're from. Hello, thank you for having me. I'm Tracy Davey, I live in Iowa City. Been here at the same house 25 years, which is one block behind Kirkwood. Two weeks ago, city councilors voted to pass the rezoning resolution while also acknowledging that urban air pollution in Southeast Iowa City needs to be addressed. The city is adding another chemical facility within a heavily populated residential area and in doing so may endanger public health. This is a serious decision. We believe the city has an obligation to gather baseline data, measurements germane to chemical manufacturing, when near seven schools and neighborhoods with vulnerable populations like my own. It has to happen prior to rezoning. Local UI engineering researchers familiar with the situation tell us that the first step must be to gather accurate and independent baseline data. They recommend this, um, and this is in my email, ECT, which is a, uh, has a local branch, very convenient for us. They absolutely have the advanced technological expertise to do this job. If not rejected outright, like it should be, at least facilitate data collection prior to rezoning. You can prove cities that your commitment to sustainable and um, safe city management. Ask yourselves, why are prominent city voices telling you, the council, to disregard the scientific evidence that we've presented? When deflection and disinformation are set aside, the proposal fails, fails all the rezoning criteria. It is not compatible to have industrial zones within seven schools, in the center of seven schools, 12 places of worship. It fails to meet the rezoning criteria, so you cannot pass it. Procter & Gamble has, has had ample opportunity to establish their so-called good land stewardship in the face of numerous com community complaints over the last decade, and they failed. Has P&G hired independent environmental consultants to assess the public health impacts of their facilities? No. Did they set up fence line monitoring behind Southeast Junior High to guarantee the safety of those developing kids from petrochemical chemicals, petrochemical pollutants? When I asked Townsend this after the last meeting, he said no, there are no fence line monitoring stations set up. I asked why, he said it's not required. Due diligence demands the deferral or absolute rejection and gathering of baseline air quality data prior to making Thank this you. decision. Thank you. Anyone else want to address this topic? Seeing no one in person or online. Council discussion. I, I, go ahead. No, I was gonna say, I, I took down sort of three clusters of notes here. Um, one, the comment about don't tear down the building that is in my heart to keep buildings as long as we can and reuse them for sustainability reasons. But we are limited with non-historic buildings on telling people that they can and can't tear them down and so, I hear what you're asking, and I, I don't know that that's a, a, an option for us. Um, I also heard comments about um, us making good on our promise to do air quality work session, and we will do that. It's if you notice, sometimes our work sessions do get backed up. We have a lot and lot. We have a lot of them to work through, housing issues to to talk about, um, preservation issues to talk about. So I, we will talk about it. Um, and then um, the, the last question or the, the last thing I wrote down is um, compatibility and I, I still see it geometrically the same way as there's industrial on both sides of this site and, and, uh, and there is a railroad track and a big road and so it's hard to imagine it as anything else. So um, I, I, the main thing that I wanted to uh, hit on is something that Josh touched on as well. Um, I guess I'll talk a little bit broader than that. Um, the idea of a uh, task force 
to address issues of air pollution in um, in the southeast side is still alive and well. Um, there was uh, a comment about um, the air quality issue being removed from the work session. Um, I reviewed that tonight, uh, and it, it's still there. It's on our pending work sessions topic, so it might not be in the place that you're looking for, um, but during any work session, we are now able to discuss air quality issues. Um, so just be, be assured by that. Um, to, to that end, um, I, don't, I don't think that my thoughts have changed any um, from, from the previous meeting. Um, and, and just like Josh said, when we're talking about industrial on both sides, we're talking about north and south, uh, or at least you know mid, mid am, and uh, we're talking about um, the, the pre-existing oral B, right? Um, no matter how you look at it, it's the same every way around that property. It's pre-existing infrastructure. The, the facilities are pre-existing. Um, so fundamentally, I don't see it as changing the character of the neighborhood. Um, I see it as in line with the uh, recommendations by staff, um, and I will be approving tonight. I don't really have anything to add to that, but I do want to correct the record just real quickly because I believe in giving credit where due. Um, I was mistakenly uh, identified as the person who came up with the idea for the air quality, looking further into that, and that was Councilor Dunn. Um, I supported it, uh, but just so for public record, um, just uh, in record of whatever, um, just again, I don't want to take credit for somebody else's good idea, so wanted to wanted to make sure that everybody knew that. So. It would also be up to this council discussion during the work session to determine if there is a task force. I, I don't want to make mm -hmm. want to make it clear that that discussion remains to be seen. Mm -hmm. I'm also like Councillor Dunn in that. Um, I mean, this is it. It's an incredibly difficult situation. Um, I do think that we need to look at uh, the urban air pollution in the area. I'm also a Southeast side resident. Um, and so it is something that we need to look at for myriad reasons that um, you all have reiterated, that Mayor Pro Tem has talked about, um, many up here on council. But there's, I go back to what Councilor Dunn talked about is that this is not this is a zoning issue and, in fact, perhaps commonsensically or perhaps how you are experiencing it, you say it doesn't make sense, but in fact, if you look, there is. There's the Mid-American plant and then there's Oral-B, so it's, it is zoned for these areas. That's what the zoning office does. So. Um, I am absolutely in favor of sooner rather than later, looking into um, getting data. But I also, at the same time that there is experience, important lived experience from what you're saying, I have seen pregnant workers, I have seen the um, unions stamp within that, and trust and believe that the Teamsters are not going to put their people in a place that's not safe to work, let alone in an area that is emitting. So, the other anyway, thing I, I will take it from where she, uh, uh, the um, industrial area there, I understand what you're saying, um, Council Arthur, the Mid American and the uh, Oral B, and this is in the middle. Yes, but let us go back and see when those area has been rezoned as industrial. This is was, the neighborhood was not like that. It wasn't a lot residential area there. If it's up to me and I have a power, if I really have power right now, I will move oral beef, I will move Procter and Gamble from there and put it like toward the end of the city. Since I don't have that power, why I increase industrial area in that area? This is specifically this college. I want that to that college. And Cindy was my teacher. So that was beautiful building. And just to see like all this container now, like outside, and that's by itself. K 
changing how the community was looked before. I, uh, I still have concern about the air quality and everything, and putting a text for, for air quality, what are we gonna do? What the power we have as a council? To tell them you cannot do it and they have license to put that you know, pollution on there. They have license. I think even the text score that we're talking about is really useless. It's not, we're gonna bring the study, and they will say, yeah, it have pollution on there. Okay, what else we can do? They have license to do this job. You know, so uh, the only thing really the council have in their hand right now is just not to add to it. But we cannot eliminate it. We cannot, you know, just uh, wipe it out or take it off. But the only thing that we can do, and we have a power to do, is do not increase in the serial area in that area. I will be proudly voting no for this project. I, I very strongly disagree that there's nothing that we can do about this. I think that that um, completely ignores the ability that we have to work as trustworthy community partners who are you know, going towards a common goal and good relationships, right? The city has leverage in our relations with businesses. We have capital that can be used to address common issues. Hell, if we want to say, talk to Procter & Gamble, we do this investigation and uh, we figure out where there's a problem, right? Whether it's Procter & Gamble or, or someone else, right? We have the ability to, as a council, say, we would like to put your tax dollars towards addressing this issue so that our residents don't address this. You cannot tell me that we don't have that power. And you cannot tell me that they're gonna turn down free money to fix that problem. I will be waiting for that meeting and see what we can do. It's not going to be productive, though, if yeah. people don't believe that the change is possible in the first place. If you go into something and you say, no, nothing's possible, there's no power, they have a license to pollute, they may have a license to pollute, but we also have a license to partner and solve problems. Yeah, yes, good energy, Council done. But we'll see how that will go. Roll call, please. Harmson? Uh, yes. Mo? Yes. Salah? No. Teague? Yes. Alter? Yes. Done. Yes. Motion passes five to one. Could I get a motion to accept earlier correspondence? So moved, Harmson. Second. Mo. Oh. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes six to zero. Item number 10 is our, our regular formal agenda. 10A is Iowa Bridge Trail Underpass Bridges Project. Resolution approving a project manual and estimate of cost for the construction of the Iowa Avenue Bridge Trail Underpass Bridge Project. Establish an amount of bid security to accompany each bid. Directing city clerk to post notice to bidders and fixing time and place for receipt of bids. I'm gonna open the public hearing. And welcome, Ethan. Thank you, Mayor. Yep. Uh, I'm here to talk about the Iowa Avenue Bridge Trail Underpass Project. Um, I want to start with a little bit of background. Um, this year, during the 2023 Biennial Bridge Inspection, uh, it was noticed that these bridges to the pedestrian tunnel are starting to deteriorate and fail, so we had to close the pedestrian tunnel for safety reasons. Um, and here are a few of the pictures showing the underside, which both can show that there's concrete's falling off, as well as the rebar and t post tensioning is starting to fail. And so this project would include uh, demolition of those existing uh, approaches uh, building new steel structures to support the new bridges as well as reinforced concrete and new steel guardrails. And I do just want to mention that this is just for the approaches to the pedestrian tunnel and not anything else there. Uh, the estimated cost for this project is $170,000. Uh, bid letting is April 23rd. The award is May 7th. Uh, construction is expected to start mid to late May, and completion is expected around mid-July. Are there any questions? Yeah, quick question about the 
Is it, is it changing the geometry of the approaches, and is it going to be fully accessible with these um, modifications? Yep, so essentially our plan is to put back very similar what's there. Uh, we're just kind of changing how they're built, because these are just using like the pre prefab concrete right now, and right now we're gonna switch it so that the water doesn't infiltrate as much and cause as much damage to the slabs. As far as like slopes and grades though, like I know I've ridden, tried to ride my bike under that thing in the past, which isn't a bad idea. Yeah, currently the plan is to kind of keep that all very similar to what it is currently. And because is it actually currently meet accessibility requirements and will it with these improvements? I would have to double check that okay. to make sure. And then the second but I know at least the cross slope would definitely meet, make sure that that met okay. compliance. And then the second piece of this is, is how much effort has been put into the um, Burlington Street Bridge design process? And is this, does this, does this tie into that sidewalk at all? And is there any reconfiguration of sidewalks when we redo the bridge? We'll let Jason talk on that one. Good evening, Jason Hobble, city engineer. Um, as far as the Burlington Street Bridge project goes, we're just at the very early stages with that. Uh, we're currently in the consultant selection process for the study phase of that, so the very first phase of that project. So I would say we, at this point, we don't anticipate this being part of that project. It would be focused really kind of in the Burlington Street corridor, um, but we'll obviously look at sidewalk connections and how those might play into that project, I'd say. So I, at this point, I would say probably not, but we'll find that out for sure as we work through that design process. Okay. Yeah, I just, it's a miserable place for cyclists, cars, and, and, and walkers, yep. that, that stretch, so. Yeah, so we'll definitely take a look at those connections and what the, that those extensions look like, but we just don't know at this time. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. Anyone from the public like to address this topic? If you're online, please raise your hand. Seeing no one in person or online, I'm gonna close the public hearing. Could I get a motion to approve, please? So move. Second. Move by Salah, seconded by Alter. Council discussion. I'm glad we have an architect on the council now who can answer some. I'm very excited about the Burlington Street project. So yeah. uh, bridge project. I think that we can make the city a lot safer for people with that river walk area mm -hmm. being an amenity instead of a death trap. So yeah, no, I'm just glad. One piece of it. Put questions that were like colleague to colleague and Thanks. <laughs> help us all understand better. Mm -hmm. Roll call, please. Mo? Yes. Salah? Yes. Teague? Yes. Alter? Yes. Dunn? Yes. Harmson? Yes. Motion passes six to zero. Item 10B, Mormon Track Peep CC Patching Project, Resolution Approving Project, Manual and Estimate of Cost for the Construction of the Mormon Track PCC Patching Project, Establishing Amount of Bid Security to Accompany Each Bid, Directing City Clerk to Post Notice to Bidders and Fixing Time and Place for Receipt of Bids. I'm gonna open the public hearing. And welcome. Good evening. I'm Mari Van Dyke. I'm with the Engineering Division. Uh, so this project involves uh, street patching on Mormon Trek Boulevard from Melrose <coughs> Avenue north to the Iowa City limits, which is right before the railroad tracks. Um, so more, overall, Mormon Trek's in pretty good condition, but there are several locations that have a lot of cracking, as you can see in this picture. And so the goal of this project would be to replace the pavement in these cracked areas so that we prevent the cracks from um, spreading to the adjacent panels. Uh, with our patches, we'll also be including um, additional steel reinforcement in the patches so that uh, we help kind of prevent similar cracking from occurring in the same locations. Uh, so with all of this patching, we'll be extending the life of the pavement so that we are getting as much use as possible out of the existing pavement before it reaches a point where it needs to be completely reconstructed. Um, as always, we wanna minimize traffic impacts as much as possible. Uh, Mormon Trek is four lanes and then it's divided by that center median. So our plan is to maintain one lane of traffic in each direction throughout the project. Uh, at this time, we don't anticipate a need for any complete closures. 
Uh, so project schedule, we would open bids April 23rd, award the contract May 7th, and then construction would go from May to August this year. The estimated construction cost is $670,000. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Are there any penalties for failure to complete on time for this project? So there will be $500 per day liquidated damages uh, every day past the final completion date, which um, is the substantial completion date, meaning that the roadway needs to be reopened is two weeks before the first home football game. Perfect. That was my next question, <laughs> yeah. is how does this align with football season? Yeah. So, perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Right. No other questions. Thank you. Anyone from the public like to address this topic? If you're online, please raise your virtual hand. See no one in person or online. I'm going to close the public hearing. Can I get a motion to approve, please? So moved. Alter. Second. Mo. Okay, now we should probably wait for Councilor Dunn. If you'd like to, uh, or you can move ahead, yeah, either way. It's that enough? He, I, he asked me whether he needed to be present for this vote, uh, and I said no, he did not. And so oh, okay, I wasn't aware. All right, okay. uh, Council discussion. Just glad it'll be done before the first home game. Thank you, staff, for doing that. <laughs> Roll call, please. Sella? Yes. Teague? Yes. Alter? Yes. Harmson? Yes. Mo? Yes. Motion passes 5 to 0. Item number 10C is uh, $3,322,000 sewer revenue capital loan note public hearing. Resolution instituting proceedings to take additional action for the uh, authorization of a loan and disbursement agreement on the insurance of $3,322,000 sewer revenue capital loan notes. And I'm going to open the public hearing and welcome Nicole. Hello, good evening again, Mayor and Council. Nicole Davies, Finance Director, uh, here to talk about a $3.3 million capital loan note. Um, this is for the design for two major um, projects at the wastewater treatment plant, the first one being the digester complex rehab, um, the second part being the digester gas improvements. Really, I'd say the first one is for needed maintenance, some efficiency improvements. The second one is to be able to take the natural gas that is now being let off into the air and repiping it into the pipeline to reuse that natural gas. Um, with this loan note, we had a call back in November as we were working on the CIP plan with our bond council, our municipal advisor. Um, they had mentioned that an SRF loan, which stands for State Revolving Fund, um, might be a good fit for this project. Um, we weren't sure with the timing that it was going to work out, but Public Works was able to get the initial application filed by the end of November, which got um, approval in March to put us as a project priority list. Um, on their intended use plan. Um, we'll still need to, for that loan, complete um, some technical and environmental reviews and then the project bidding. And then at that point, we would file the ac actual application for the construction loan. Um, and then, which wouldn't be we, probably until early 2025. And then after that, we'd have the loan disbursement and closeout, which is probably about a year from this time. But along with that, we can apply for a 0% planning and design fee loan, which is what this piece of it is. Um, so obviously, if we can get a loan for about a year at 0% interest and continue to earn um, interest on the money that we're holding, it's a good deal for the city. So this part is to approve the uh, this loan to sign all the documents for the 0% design loan, um, and then when the other loan closes, this would roll into that at that time, which, like I said, would be about a year from now. The reason we're looking at this is interest rates appear to be 1% to 2% better than what we would get if we went out um, on the market and got revenue bonds. The current rates for this program is 2.75 for tax exempt and about 4.02 for taxable, which we'll probably have both um, with this project, the first project, which would be tax exempt. We are expecting the digester um, gas improvements to be taxable, but still 
2.75 and 4%. And again, that's what the interest rates are now. They will be different a year from now, hopefully even slightly less, but we have no control over that. And again, this is covering both items 10C and 10D. Any questions? Have we used state revolving fund loans much in the past? Are there any strings attached or anything that makes them operate differently than special? Uh, so to my knowledge, we have never used it before. Okay. Um, my understanding, there's more front end work of the, with the environmental re reviews, um, but it kind of sounds like we go through some of that anyway. So why exactly we've never used it before, I don't know. It does sound like they've recently changed the program to make the interest rates better. So I think that difference is, is larger and therefore making it a better option for us. Okay. I have a really basic question. Uh, what's the difference between just a loan and a loan note? Like, Good is question. the terminology <laughs> super relevant, or does it mean the same thing? I, or? I think that's just referring to the document itself. I mean, oh. it, it's a loan. <laughs> okay, I was just curious. I, if I'd seen that before, I, I wasn't recalling, so. Yeah. So, this might be because of the time of night. Um, <laughs> what actual dollar amount is the amount that you're applying for for the zero percent. It's not the that's full. That's the 3.3. Oh, it million. is that's, the full yeah, that, that's, three point. That's just for the planning that's and design. That's just for the design, right. The, whole, million the total for the project design. is 33 million. Okay. Yeah. Between Contact. the two pieces. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and can you remind Still. us when that's in our capital improvement schedule? Well, the $30 million spend. Is they're it? designing it now, right? With, I mean, it's in the plan for 24. Obviously, okay. the design is happening now, so we don't expect construction until early, about a year from now. Okay. And this is Enterprise Fund, correct? Yep. Yeah. Wastewater. All right. Hearing no more questions. Thank you. Anyone from the public like to address this topic? Seeing no one online or in person, I'm going to close the public hearing. Can I get a motion to approve, please? So moved. Alter. Second, Mo. All right, council discussion. Roll call, please. Teague? Yes. Alter? Yes. Dunn? Yes. Harmson? Yes. Mo? Yes. Salah? Yes. Motion passes 5 to 0. Item 10D? Uh, 6 to 0, Mayor, on this one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 6. What did I say? Did ten. I say 10? Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> it's item 10. Are you talking about the time? <laughs> the ten. Ten. Yes, 6 <laughs> to 0. And I'm looking at item 10D, yeah. which we're going to go to now. Yeah. $3,322,000. Dollar sewer revenue capital loan note. This is a resolution approving and authorizing a form of interim loan and disbursement ag agreement by and between the City of Iowa City and the Iowa Finance Authority, and authorizing and providing the for the insurance and securing the payment of three million three hundred and twenty-two thousand dollars sewer revenue capital loan notes anticipation project note. Series 2024 of the City of Iowa City, Iowa, under the provisions of the Code of Iowa in providing for a method of payment of said note. And can I get a motion to approve, please? Move, Mo. Second. Uh, seconded by Sully. She's right next to me. <laughs> All right, um, she's louder. <laughs> Presentation given um, was with the item 10C. So is there anyone from the public that would like to address this topic? Seeing no one in person or online. Uh, council discussion. Roll call, please. Alter? Yes. Dunn? Yes. Harmson? Yes. Mo? Yes. Celeste? Yes. Teague? Yes. Motion passes 6 to 0. Item 10E, block by block downtown cleaning agreement. Resolution authorizing the city manager to sign an agreement with Madat Services, Inc., DBA block by block, and the Iowa City Downtown District for cleaning of City Plaza, downtown sidewalks, downtown public alleyways, and city owned parking ramps. And um, could I get a motion to approve, please? Do not move. Second. Move by Sala, second by Alter, and we're going to welcome Danielle. Welcome. Hi there. Gary Nagel Dan, yeah. Director of Transportation It is getting Services. late. <laughs> that's, a, that's all right. I'm going to cover a presentation for both 10E and 10F tonight. So um, 
historically the city of Iowa City has contracted for janitorial services in the downtown and in the city owned parking ramps as well as partnering with the downtown district for contracted power washing services. And in an effort to advance their safe and clean downtown initiative, the Iowa City Downtown District approached the city about partnering on a contract with Block by Block, who's a national um, firm specializing in cleaning, safety, and hospitality services in downtown districts. So simultaneously, the city has been experiencing some pretty significant and substantial ongoing challenges with substandard service being provided by the downtown janitorial contract holder. So as a result, the city agreed to partner with the downtown district on a service agreement with Block by Block for enhanced cleaning and ambassador services in the downtown and in the downtown parking ramps. So a little bit about Block by Block. Again, it's a national company. They specialize in cleaning, safety, and hospitality. That's unique in that they focus on all three of those um, different areas. And they work specifically in improvement districts or SMIDs or downtown districts, much like Iowa City's. Um, they also work in parks, transit systems, and municipalities to give you a little bit of background about what they do. They've been in business since 1995, um, and now they serve more than 140 clients with a 96% retention rate. Um, there's some, some improvement district examples are Des Moines, um, where they provide uh, services. Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Grand Rapids, Michigan, and South Bend, Indiana are four, four examples um, of the communities they currently serve, and they've provided very positive feedback on the company. Um, in fact, we did visit the Des Moines operations to um, tour their facilities and check out their operations and, and just kind of get a lay of the land downtown, and, and we were impressed by their work maintaining um, the downtown district there. So the proposal tonight that you see before you, the, the agreement provides um, the proposal provides 268 hours a week of downtown cleaning plus 168 hours a week of parking garage cleaning, um, including a full-time on-site operations manager that would support both the parking ramps and the downtown um, activities. Coverage would be provided seven days a week, approximately 16 hours a day, included early morning and um, later evening hours. Now. On the cleaning side of things, the services that will be provided, again, will be enhanced over what we have had um, with our previous contractees. It's going to include trash and litter removal, weed control, manual mechanical cleaning, graffiti removal, um, detail cleaning, and other sort of special projects. But in addition to that, and this is kind of new and exciting, there's going to be hospitality and ambassador services. So that um, includes everything from public relations checks with the businesses, um, reporting and referrals for um, quality of life issues, working with the downtown um, police liaison, and, um, and so on, and really to represent um, themselves to be helpful representatives of downtown and of Iowa City. We want them to represent um, this community with pride, um, that they're friendly, that they're helpful representatives. So really, they're going to really take on an ambassador role, and that's not something that we've had before. So we're really excited about that potential opportunity. In addition, so the downtown ambassadors, which will be the name that they will take on, they're also going to be equipped to capture and report upon daily metrics of services provided and incidents or maintenance issues required, or excuse me, maintenance issues encountered. And that's, um, that's definitely a level up from, from what we've had in the past. This would allow us collecting that data. Um, they collect it very quickly on, on smartphones, will allow us to get, get a real picture of what's happening in the downtown, what our janitorial needs are, what our safety needs are, um, and really be more strategic about how, how we, we, um, uh, we um, allocate those resources throughout the downtown. So we're very excited about that opportunity as well. Another feature to this agreement is that the organization provides flexibility to bank or reallocate hours to high demand events. This is something that would be new to us too that we, that we thought was really great. So for example, during the summer, we have all those great festivals in the downtown. And as you all probably can imagine, it takes a lot more work, um, especially during the events, but afterwards to clean up. Well, this contract has the flexibility to be able to shift um, hours around and then um, move them to around um, events and things like that when we need greater support. Football games is another another um, reason we're excited about that. 
we're going to continue to contract with Fresh Starts um, for additional help during festivals. That's been something that we've been doing to try to supplement the, uh, the amount of support that we can give. And then, of course, all the baseline existing service levels provided by the city through the Transportation Services Department will still be maintained. Okay, so in terms of um, staff for Block by Block, they are going to provide their, their staff with comprehensive initial and ongoing training and quality. We were really impressed with the level of training um, that, they, that they provide for their employees, the resources they give them to be able to do their jobs really well. They're paid uh, living wages. They started 1850 um, for their frontline, if you will, team leads 22, and then that really important operations manager, $35 um, dollars an hour. And all employees receive health care, dental insurance, paid vacations, free life insurance, 401k, birthday pay, all season uniforms, That's we'll get to that again in a second, and rec recognition and rewards programs. So um, the, the total package is one that I think is going to create an environment um, that, that people really want to work in, and it's going to help attract um, people who can help support our downtown um, in a greater way than maybe our previous contracts had. Um, back to that point about uniforms, so all the block by block employees would have the uniforms, um, vehicles and the equipment would all be branded consistent with the downtown Iowa City branding, so you're going to see red, of course. Um, and we haven't gotten through the design um, clearly yet, we've been kicking around some ideas, but I think you're going to see an enhanced level of visibility and professionalism that we, that we didn't have before. I don't think anybody could have pointed out any of our janitorial services staff before, um, but since they're taking on also this potential ambassador role, we really want them to be visible for the public and visible and professional and really represent the downtown well. Speaking of downtown, so the service area is going to include the downtown district boundaries, um, targeted gateways into the downtown, of course the six city-owned parking ramps as I mentioned before, and the city is going to manage the parking ramp portion of the contract and the downtown district would manage the, the downtown portion of the contract. Um, the joint management is um, going to allow the downtown district that extra flexibility to have block by block work in um, kind of gap areas like private alcoves and things like that, places that the city was not able to manage because they're private. Um, we're going to be able to better in a, in a joint um, with our joint strategy, we're going to be able to better holistically address all of the downtown needs. And also, um, as part of the partnership, the city and the downtown district will enter into a memorandum of agreement, which is the next item on the agenda, related to the sharing of equipment, equipment storage spaces, reporting metrics, general procedures for joint management of the contract. And um, additionally, the city is going to lease a vacant space in the Court Street Transportation Center to the downtown district um, at a below market rate to serve as the primary office location for block by block staff. So they'll have a storefront, there'll be a place where people in the community can go to talk to block by block staff, talk to the operations manager. It's really gonna professionalize operations in a way that we have not had um, in the past. In terms of the annual contract fee, um, it will be shared between the city, 86% the city with the downtown district contributing 14%, and the city share will be funded through the parking and general fund revenues as follows. It's a three-year agreement, the proposals for three-year agreements um, with, um, with subsequent renewal periods, year one, 710,000, year two, 720,650, and year three, it would be $738,666 right now. And each of those renewal periods that I mentioned would um, be limited to a maximum of 1.5%. So again, upon renewal, the city um, and the downtown district both agreed to continue that cost sharing, um, that 86-14 split for cost sharing. And then, of course, as I mentioned before, the downtown district would be also investing in the rent um, at the Court Street Transportation Facility that the city manages. Um, and uh, another benefit is that that rent would go to support transit services because that that specific parking facility was federally funded for tr by the Federal Transit Administration. All revenue that comes into that facility is um, earmarked for transit. So this would be also supporting transit in that way. So tonight before you, um, this resolution authorizes the city manager to enter agreement with the downtown district and block by block. The uh, current contract with ABM Industries expired yesterday. So um, 
transportation services staff were on our own for the next couple months. Um, the proposal is that the that block by block would start kick things off on June 1st. So um, so our team is um, is really. Um, battening down the hatches and getting out there and trying to make sure everything is covered and really setting um, they want that I've been joking that they've been nesting in some way shape or form because they really want to get the downtown prepared for this new organization to come in and set that expectation for what um, a really great excellent clean safe comfortable um, downtown district looks like so I'd be happy to answer any questions you said who, who was uh when the, the, the organization or the company expired today or yesterday? Yes, it was What's AB, the name? ABM. ABM. And <coughs> can you tell me how much we was paying ABM to clean downtown? The contract for downtown and the parking ramps was over, I believe it was 320000 a year. And now it's 700000 Yes. That's like more than 50% increase. Well, why is that? So it's the it's the enhanced services that we're getting. Um, so the the ABM contract was a very bare bones janitorial services contract in terms of changing trash liners, picking up litter from the ground, um, detail cleaning, um, which we struggled for years with getting them to to uh, meet the tenants of the agreement in terms of the detail cleaning, um, and also in terms of um, them quite honestly meeting the base the most basic tenant of that agreement which was changing out the trash liners so we struggled mightily with them with a very very basic contract um, and the block by block contract is ex it is proposed as a much bigger expansion of what we expect this team to do so like i said it was a few um, it was the trash liners it was picking up trash um, maybe doing some detail gleaning that they that they maybe weren't doing on the other hand with the block by block it's they're doing the detail gleaning they'll be doing sweeping they'll be doing graffiti removal they will be doing um let's see here litter removal mechanical cleaning bodily fluids um, handbills and stickers and the detail cleaning that we weren't quite happy with our previous contractor doing and that's just on the janitorial services side of things so they're also going to be acting in that ambassador role so um, again the public relations checks the the reporting um, the reporting of you know quality of life issues downtown um, the after hours escorts I don't know if I mentioned that that's something that they're that we really thought was a, a great feature. So they can provide assistance for people at night to walk to their parking ramp just to have another person to walk with. So there's gonna be a way that, that people can reach out to block by block and they will stop what they're doing and they will walk somebody to their car. Um, information sharing, again, we want them to be highly visible so people walk up to them and ask them questions about where do I go here, you know, um, just being informed and uh, being an ambassador and that's not something that we've expected um, uh, or we've received from, from our previous contracting um, agencies. You mean and those things was not being done before by the other contractor? Yeah, it wasn't part of their agreement to do that ambassador role, so that's really... Not the ambassador role, that's the last thing I want to think about, but that there is another feature that, like, some type of cleaning that we were not been doing it, and now they're doing more? Because, like, <coughs> from 300,000 to 710, that's more than 100%. So uh, I, I guess we want to know like uh, how much we increase, and also I would be interesting to know uh, that increase from uh, coming from which budget, and we always been hearing we don't have money, and now this is like more than four hundred thousand extra. Yeah. Um, so let's see here. Let me. I'll address the the second piece first. So it's it's going to be funded through the parking and general fund revenues, and ultimately this was proposed in the budget as part of the parking rate and fee increase. Mm -hmm. So part of that parking rate and fee increase was designed in such a way to support enhanced cleaning services and ambassador okay. services downtown that we just did not have sure. previously. So that's so it is a new revenue source that will be funding this initiative. And we already increased our parking. Yeah, yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. 
And if I could just add, um, so the basic services, which is what the previous contract was under the ABN contract, that's what the city was providing. So our partners, our downtown partnership wanted more. So there's some aspects that's been added to the contract that's going to be shared. Those costs are going, going to be shared with uh, the downtown SMID as well. Yeah, which is uh, 86 to 18, you said? 18 percent? Something like that. Fourteen. Fourteen. Six and fourteen. 86, fourteen. 14. Yeah. yeah, fourteen and yeah, and and I'm glad that the, the downtown is stepping up and it is not something unusual for them to do, but that's that's good. Yeah, but I was just uh, want to know from where we get that cost, but is this from revenue of the parking? Yeah, it will be from the revenue from the new parking rate and citation fine increases that we'll see after July first. Okay. Can you speak a little bit about what the reporting is from this company, and then if you know you're unhappy with them, what is the city and the downtown mm -hmm. district's ability to get out if they aren't able to meet their contract requirements? So the reporting is, um, we're excited to see the reporting um, when it all comes together, but they, co they collect statistics on literally everything that they do, um, every action that they take virtually. They have a quick system that they developed, a quick app-based kind of swipe, quick, quick entry system. So um, I, I imagine it's going to be the whole gamut of everything that they do. So where did they have, uh, where did they pick up trash on the ground from? So we'll be able to kind of um, have a sense for where those situations are occurring. Where do they tr change trash liners? Where did they do, um, you know, a specialty project for us? Um, where did they have a report of something concerning in the downtown <coughs> that happened, either safety related or something they needed to call for PD support or um, all of that is literally everything is, is tracked that they do. So we're gonna have kind of a treasure trove of information to help us be more strategic about how we deploy resources downtown and just get a better sense for what's happening downtown on a daily basis um, that we hadn't had before. I was happy to see that there was something you had in the presentation had mentioned, some, mentioned something about uh, flexibility of hours and being able to schedule more folks during festivals and so on um, in the trash liners. I've noticed in, in uh, some of our many wonderful festivals downtown um, that that occasionally would be something that would struggle with um, and, you know, keeping those those empty and to a lot of people, you know, so they fill quickly. Um, I've seen parks and rec staff like that happened to be there kind of jump on some of that once in a while, which is great, good for them, but, um, and, thank, and thank you to those people who did that, city staff, who kind of stepped up. Um, but it'll be nice to have that being taken care of, um, you know, just, just have the resources necessary to handle that sort of, uh, you know, increase, especially, you know, big festivals, lots of food vendors, lots of paper plates, and so on and so forth, so. I thought I might answer one of the other uh, components of Councilor Moe's question about termination. Um, there is a termination clause in the contract. It, uh, uh, if we believe they're uh, breaching the contract, not living up to the uh, obligations that are found therein, we have to give them a notice to cure. They have 30 days to fix it. If they don't, then we're out, the uh, contract terminated. Thank you. I guess I have another question. Go ahead, Mega. I just have a simple question, I hope. Um, you mentioned you know the 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 sorry the range for the different types of jobs and um, the the pay range. Will these jobs be hired locally? Yes, yes, yep, absolutely. We'd like to hire 100% locally. Um, they like to hire their teams all locally. Local knowledge, local experience, support um, local staff. I don't know how to phrase my question, but. When we say that this contract between the block by block and the downtown district uh, for cleaning, is it downtown acting like the city, right? Making like brochure of the payment. And both of us, the downtown district and the Iowa City is contracting with block by block, or block by block and downtown district is one thing now. Like they are, I don't know, just can you explain that? Yeah, it'll be, my it'll be separate. So there'll be a set dollar amount that that the city um, contributes on a monthly basis, um, which will represent 86% of the total cost. And then the downtown district would remit 14% of that monthly payment themselves to block by block. So we would still be paying at separate Oh, like separate entities. checks from the downtown yes. and from, okay. Okay, got you. Yeah, yes. Yeah, to be clear, the downtown district is a signatory to the contract uh, with uh, block to block, uh, block by block. 
Um, That's what I'm asking, got, yeah. Yeah, and then we've got the separate MOU uh, just between us and the downtown district to govern that relationship. Okay, yeah, that's what my question was, thank you. Um, I have a question related to, were there other companies researched just to kind of compare apples to apples? Yeah, I think there's been an ongoing search for the right partner for, for many years, and, and block by block has has kind of risen to the top. Um, because of their work that they do, they specialize in downtown SMID districts. So this is just the type of support they don't, um, like I said, they do have a few other little pieces that they do from a municipal perspective, but this is really what they specialize in. Um, so this one, after researching what potential options are out there for a more specialized service that will better support the downtown. Um, ABM is kind of more of a general, um, they do all sorts of cleaning of you know, many different things, buildings, facilities, and that. But um, Block by Block is, I think, unique in their skills and talents in terms of serving downtown districts that are just like ours. So that's how they sort of rose to the top of that research. I, I think the, the mayor just remind me from the question that I forget. Why we did not open this for bed? So we were approached by the downtown district who was and Betsy could probably speak more to this, but we were approached by the downtown district again because they wanted to partner with Block by Block, and they could have partnered with Block by Block, but again, we decided to do it together um, because we saw the benefits to having a joint, joint initiative here um, and finding a provider who could meet our special needs, again, in the downtown district is why um, we went with Block by Block. It was We were approached by... Um, we were approached by the downtown district and evaluating the options that we have um, and looking back at our previous janitorial services contracting opportunities, it seemed like a right opportunity for us to try somebody different and somebody who's been specialized in serving, again, the downtown district type environments across the U.S. You know, I, I just really like the wages of like it's eighteen dollars and twenty two and thirty five is amazing. And I think they and healthcare. I think the, in terms of a good company that will treat their employees very good. I can tell from the numbers. But but you know I guess things like I I want to see in the future something like this being bet on, not like a sign. Just give it to someone, kind of. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you, Darian. Thank you. Yes. Anyone from the public like to address this topic? Welcome. Hello, oh, I'm Betsy Potter from the Iowa City Downtown District, and I don't have a ton to add because Darian did such a nice job, but I just did want to say thank you so much for the support of this and really to the staff um, on the city here because they've done a ton of work. We've been meeting for months and months, kind of going through all of these issues and answering all these questions, um, and we're really excited about it. It's we, Our initiatives and our strategic plan really has always, as you all know, uh, really talked a lot about clean and safe initiatives. and. I think this will be the first time that we're, as an organization, able to invest a lot more. So it's a 10% increase in our cleaning services from our budget line item. So we are very thrilled about that. Um, as Darian mentioned, we did go to Des Moines. They've been working, just so you all know, they've been working with Block by Block for 21 years now. So they've been very, very happy with the services. Their operations manager is terrific. So um, there's a lot, there's a really close case study here that we can rely on and kind of communicate with off. Often. And I think the greatest value of this um, new contractor in Block by Block is that they really focus on the staff and they invest in their staff. And so ultimately, those staff members really they take pride in the place. And I think that's something that we can all agree that will be a major benefit to the community. Um, it'll make hopefully downtown safer, cleaner, and more welcoming. So thank you. I'm happy to answer questions if you need, but I doubt it because she did a great job. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Any other, um, anyone else want to make a comment on this? Say no one in person or online council discussion. I'm just really excited for this. Um, I think it's going to 
greatly increase the uh, the lived experience of uh, our residents, our visitors, um, and uh, you know our, our workers and business owners downtown. So I think it's uh, I think it's great. I agree. It's uh, and I just like the labor force that they're gonna add to the community and being people like good pay and health insurance. That's amazing. And and also, yeah, we really need to keep. That's where all our visitors come to, and the first thing they go is downtown area, and we need to keep that area clean. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I work downtown, and I feel like the last several years I've seen a slump in the cleanliness in certain areas, and so I'm very excited to see a reinvestment and additional effort put towards that. Because we get, I'm excited for it. I will say this is an enormous amount of money. So when I go into the uh, parking ramps, I'll be using my sniffer to see if bodily fluid smells are still there. <laughs> it's being the, up front. The attendant will yeah. be there to spritz. <laughs> right. <laughs> One of the things that I actually, um, and I know it was just an aside, but the fact that there are people who are, there would be escorts at night is one small step, but an important one towards actually really helping create some more safety among downtown. So I, this just seems really, really great. And actually, I go to Grand Rapids often, and uh, I had no idea that that was what they did, but um, or who they partnered with, but it's very clean, so I can say that. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, this is a real testament, actually, to the other thing I was going to say that I had forgotten was the fact that this is actually all self-contained within this enterprise fund is, it's, again, it's a real testament to staff and to the collaboration to be able to figure out ways to make things better and to be able to pay for them in spite of what all we're look facing. So thank you. I, I think I understood that this is, uh, some general fund is also allocated she said no. Oops. I thought it was enterprise. enterprise. No, enterprise fund. Yes, funded. some. I don't have the split necessarily, but uh, it all uh, funded some. in terms of rev new revenues that will be coming in due to the parking rate and citation fine increases that are coming this year. That it's been 11 or so years since we've raised any of those rates, so it'll all be funded from new that, revenue sources. Yeah, that's great. Cool. Right, Sorry, I misspoke, but it is all still like the same ecosystem. Roll call, please. Dunn? Yes. Harmson? Yes. Mo? Yes. Salah? Yes. Teague? Yes. Alter? Yes. Motion passes 6 to 0. Item 10F, MOA with Downtown District for Cleaning Services. Resolution authorizing the city manager to sign a memorandum of agreement with the Iowa City Downtown District in conjunction with the agreement with Maddox Services, Inc., DBA block by block for cleaning of City Plaza downtown sidewalks, downtown public alleys, and city-owned parking ramps. Can I get a motion to approve, please? Oh, move, sorry. Second, Mo. And the presentation was given with item 10E. Anyone from the public like to address this topic? Say no one in person or online. Council discussion. Roll call, please. Dunn? Yes. Harmson? Yes. Mo? Yes. Salah? Yes. Teague? Yes. Alter? Yes. Motion passes six to zero. Item 10G is parking uh, prohi um, prohibition on the east side of Caswick Drive. Establishment of no parking anytime parking prohibition on the east side of Caswick Drive. Can I get a motion uh, to approve correspondent? Wait. No. Accepts no. correspondence? <laughs> motion to the motion to approve. Well, it, it, this is a little complicated. Uh, normally, <laughs> the council doesn't need to approve these changes. Uh, staff makes them, and they are required to give notification to you. And so normally, it is just approved as part of the consent agenda as correspondence. So it is, in fact, a motion to approve correspondence for your we council action tonight. From the consent <laughs> agenda to a, OK. Yeah. I am so confused. First time ever. Uh, <laughs> me too. Mm -hmm. All right. Could I get a motion to accept correspondence? So moved. Second, Mo. All right. Moved by Don, second by Mo, and welcome, Kent. Good evening, Mayor, Council. Thank you. Um, as the mayor mentioned, this uh, item before you is consideration of no parking anytime parking prohibition on the east side of Keswick Drive between Benton Street and Wheaton Road. 
It's about a 400 foot stretch of road, which is typical of a city block uh, here in Iowa City. Um, this portion of Keswick Drive is 25 feet wide and the prohibition is consistent with the existing parking prohibition uh, just to the north of Wheaton Road, uh, just to the north of this section. Uh, if approved, on-street parking will continue to be available on the west side of Keswick Drive. So we're just talking about removal of one side. Uh, and all affected households adjacent to this por portion of Keswick Drive have been notified of the proposed action. Uh, at your March 19th meeting, this item was deferred, which I think is why this is a little bit different for you all tonight. Um, I know you've had a long night, but I just wanted to take a few minutes just to describe a little bit about how uh, we work through our process when these requests come to our office and then how these ultimately end up uh, before you. Um, the city subdivision code uh, regulates on-street parking on newly constructed streets, and it's very clear uh, streets that are 28 feet wide or wider can allow parking on both sides of the street. Streets that are less than 28 feet wide, uh, parking is restricted just one side of the street. So that's newly constructed roads and subdivisions. Uh, while the city code provides those clear regulations and new subdivisions, it's a little bit more murky for existing streets, which is the case of Keswick Drive tonight. Uh, in general, the code states that parking can be prohibited on one side of the street when it does not exceed 30 feet in width, and it can be prohibited on both sides of the street uh, when it is less than 20 feet in width. So just some general parameters that's provided by the code. Um, because there's some flexibility in the code, we typically use sort of the following process I'll outline for you. Uh, and first off, on local and collector streets, on-street parking prohibitions are really generally limited to one side of the street. In very rare cases do we have prohibitions on both sides of the streets for obvious reasons. It creates hardships for uh, those that live in the neighborhood. Uh, the first situation I'll outline is when a request to prohibit on-street parking is requested by a city department, whether it's streets, fire, police, uh, what we'll do in those cases and just is investigate what the request is and then we bring those to you um, because sometimes those are emergency situations where either a fire truck hasn't been able to navigate a street that's too narrow uh, that has parking on both sides or uh, garbage collection simply can't get garbage picked up plowing that sort of thing uh, so we'll bring those straight to you uh, the next uh, situation is what we have on Keswick Drive, is when the request to prohibit on-street parking is generated by a resident. So in this case, we had a complaint from a resident. Uh, we actually went out and observed that the complaint, uh, in fact, was taking place, which is a narrow street with parking on both sides of the street, uh, when the cars are directly opposite each other, creating uh, sort of a bottleneck. Uh, what we do in those cases is we will notify the neighborhood of the request, uh, which we did, and then we bring that to you all uh, for consideration. In this case, we also talked to the streets superintendent, which indicated that he had difficulty plowing Keswick uh, this winter. That said, he also indicated that he had difficulty plowing a lot of uh, roads this winter because of the heavy snowfall we had. Uh, and then the last thing we'll do uh, is if we can't document vehicles parked directly opposite each other, uh, we take no further action. If the neighborhood wants to move forward with a prohibition anyway, we'll then do a neighborhood survey. So in that case, we would actually request a, um, a petition be signed by 50% of the affected households on, in this case, it would be Keswick. Uh, and then we, uh, we, we need 50% of responses. And then of the 50%, we want 60% uh, majority of those responses to be in favor of the proposed action, then we bring it to you. Uh, but again, that's when we get a request from the neighborhood that we, we really can't, um, we can't see when we go out and visit it. Uh, what I did for you is in your packet, uh, I don't have it on the screen here, but in your packet, I provided some different scenarios. And basically what I tried to do is provide uh, a scenario by what I'll call a best case scenario and a worst case scenario on Keswick Drive, which is 25 feet wide. Um, the best case scenario would be if you have two smaller cars parked directly at the curbs, uh, a small vehicle is about six feet wide, and that would leave 12 feet passing. A uh, fire truck is 10 feet wide. So if a fire truck is trying to navigate the street in that best case scenario on Keswick, you've got about a foot on either side of that fire truck, which is gonna be pretty tight if you're in a hurry, or even if you're not in a hurry collecting garbage or plowing, it's gonna be tight. Um, then the other depiction in your uh, packet was what I'll consider a worst case scenario. So on Keswick Drive, if two large SUVs or trucks are parked uh, directly opposite each other, parked 18 inches from the curb, which you can legally do as part of our code, that leaves a passing width of about six feet. And again, a fire truck's about 10 feet wide. So wh again, while the code is a little less clear on existing streets, that's why for new subdivisions, we have that 28 foot wide and wider. We allow parking on both sides, but less than that, we don't. 
Um, but again, uh, we brought this to the council back in 2019. There's about 100 streets in town that currently allow parking on both sides that are less than 28 feet wide. And back in 2019, the council said, you know, we don't want to just blanket pro, uh, prohibit parking on one side of those streets, but we'll use this process to sort of just work our way through these if and when we uh, have problems. So that's sort of the background, uh, the quick background on this. Happy to answer any questions you have. You said uh, the, the, um, the superintendent said they have hard time of doing like snow and that. Yeah. Is this something new? No, not particularly. I mean, parking changes on streets because people move uh, in and out, that sort of thing. Um, he had indicated they had a lot of difficulty on a lot of narrow roads this winter, so keep that in mind uh, in your deliberations. Um, but he did say they could. this is one of the ones they could not get down, and this is one of the streets that had a neighborhood complaint. Um, so that's why it's before you tonight. Yeah, because if this has been forever, forever, like long time, like years, and they was ne the, the superintendent never complained about cleaning or the fire. What would happen to you? That's the only thing that I want to know. Yeah. So what what we do at the end of each winter? So come spring, whenever whenever the superintendent gets to us, he will actually have a list of streets that he would like to remove parking on, and then we sort of go through this process again. So even though he may have had difficulty in years past, it may not have risen to the level of saying, okay, we really need to restrict parking and Kent, I want you to go to the city council and, and you know, uh, ask for them to consider it. So it may be that somebody moved in this, this year that had additional vehicles parked in the street. You may have new drivers because there's new children on the street, you know, that sort of thing. Um, but he did not come to us. The neighborhood first requested this. Then we checked with him and he agreed that it was an issue. And I did not understand the politicians, uh, what you said earlier. You mean like even if we approve this tonight, if the neighbor start petition, and 50% said, so I, I if didn't you get approved, that. if you approved this tonight, and the neighborhood wanted to add the parking back, we would also request a petition from them, and we would just re reverse the process where to add parking, we would ask them to have the petition signed by 50% of the neighborhood. Then we would want 50% of those mail back survey cards back, and a majority 60%. It's the same um, process we use for traffic calming for neighborhood traffic calming requests yes. as well. We use that same kind of uh, mechanism. Mm -hmm. I would say, however, if we removed parking, because we are concerned about emergency response, we should be very careful to add the parking back because then we just get back into the same issue we have now, which is difficulty with plowing and potentially emergency response. Do we, um, are other cities striping their parking zones to constrain the width that cars can park in? I know that there is serious cost to striping, but it seems like as cars keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger and our road costs keep getting higher and higher and higher, there might be an opportunity there to um, restrict that side parking to only six feet wide vehicles and maintain safety is are there I know we don't do that are other communities doing that and what are the pitfalls not that I'm aware of I mean you'll see it closer to downtowns typically um, you know where there's metered stalls and that sort of thing but I'm I'm not aware of of any community that's just striping their residential neighborhoods right I think just because of the cost okay yeah. Um, but that seems to be the problem. The change has been there's new, larger vehicles on the street that's causing this issue. So but we can prohibit riding together. You know, we can we can put a sign and say, you know, larger vehicles, Marky, or something I, like that. I think striping would be the one thing we could do, but we have not don't have any experience with it, and it sounds like the... <clears throat> yeah, and I would, I would say, um, speaking for streets and, and probably the city manager's office, I mean, to do those additional striping projects would be extremely cost prohibitive. And right now, I think we have, we struggle just to keep up with the striping we have. Um, I think it's safe to say that the city manager's office would, would give you the same information. Oh yeah, I know they don't want to do that, but um, I think that there's an opportunity to make a road smaller. Any other questions? All right, we're gonna thank you. Thank you. Any um, one from the public like to address this topic? Please come, welcome. Hi there. Uh, Douglas Walton, I live at 830 Keswick. Um, I'm gonna provide some of the details that were left out here on this. Uh, first off, one of the pictures in there, of the main picture is not of Keswick. Uh, it's, not even, it's not even of the street. So uh, to me, it's, it does feel like it has a lot of bearing on that. The, the issue is, and I brought this up two weeks ago when we were here, 
We had a neighbor move in who has opened up a commercial business that maintains two large commercial vehicles on the property. They use the garage to store commercial supplies and they park their commercial trucks on the street. Lived there for 25 years. Literally, this is the first problem that's ever come up. My wife and I were probably the ones that called when the snowplow couldn't come down the street. And it was the neighbors across the street that had a separate car that they owned that was parked opposite of their two large trucks. Other than that, I can't think of another time where we've ever had this issue. So I think completely redoing things for one incident because we have a nuisance neighbor that runs a commercial business out of their house that just started here in September seems to be you know, we're kind of cutting off the head to cure the headache. So I, I guess I would like the council to think about that because once this is gone, trying to get people organized to bring the parking back and everything else, it, the likelihood that it's probably going to work out real well is probably not high. So the decision that gets made tonight is probably going to be permanent. So there, you know, I would also state that Willow Creek Park is right across the street. There are a number of organizations that soccer leagues, there's volunteer, there's, uh, there's, there's walks, all kinds of things. People use that street to park. You're also limiting the parking for those things in the middle of the summer when there's really not an issue. The real issue really comes in the winter time when the plows can't get close enough to the curbs. So it restricts access to the street. So it's not only just restricting to the 13 houses, you're restricting other people that use Willow Creek Park in the surrounding area. So that's, that's all I got to say. I appreciate your time tonight. And I know it's been a long night for you guys. It's been a long night for us as well, waiting to speak. So I appreciate your time and, and I'll step away. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else like to address this topic? Say no one in person or online. Council discussion. Just to clarify, we are discussing, discussing whether we will receive correspondence. Right. Well, yes, again, what the ordinance calls for is that staff make these decisions, the end, but that they have to notify you. So, I mean, ultimately, if your vote is no on this, you would probably want to just direct staff that um, we don't want to see that change. And, you know, staff will, um, you know, respond accordingly. Mm-hmm. One of the questions I have um, that just came up, Kent, what are, I know when snow happens, um, you know, there are signs that say no parking, um, or can signs say parking on this side of the road um, on snow days, or what are options for snow removal? So we have a snow ordinance, um, which I would probably rely on the city attorney to, to give you more information on, but we have a snow ordinance uh, that we don't use very often. Um, in terms of, of, of sort of temporarily restricting parking to move snow, we do that, I think, in places in town, but I don't know that we, I don't know that we do it out in the far sort of neighborhoods. Um, I would have to check on that for sure, um, but I, it's not something that we can rely on very, very well. I think, because we don't know when the snow is going to come, and it takes sure. more staff time to get out there and, and post these things. Um, the streets department would certainly do that, but um, I don't know if I can answer your question very clearly on on whether or not it's a good option or not. Unfortunately, sure. maybe you know, just letter to the neighborhood during snow time and say, hey, you have to know that you cannot bark here during snow. Because think about it, all summer there is no snow removal. The people can really enjoy barking there. And uh, just during winter, maybe we can do something. That's why last time I said, can the staff be creative and just figure out something? It's yeah. a little bit hard to get creative. I, th I think if the if the council is struggling with this, I think the easiest thing to probably do is survey the neighborhood. That's what we would do in other cases where the neighborhood would say, you know, we want a parking change. Uh, we're seeing issues. We go out and can't observe those issues. Uh, as I outlined earlier, we would survey the neighborhood. Um, you know, in this case, we've not heard from police or fire that it's an issue. Um, so it, that is an option as we could survey the neighborhood. Um, otherwise, I would move forward with uh, the proposed. 
if you guys think about surveying the neighborhood. That sounds like a good idea. Yeah, and it is not winter. Uh, yeah, it is. <laughs> there is snow as today, but it's not bad. You know, it wasn't that bad. So I, I think the, the, I think there is no an urgency to do this. Can we just give it a chance and do the surveying neighborhood? And mm -hmm. I don't have a real opposition necessarily if that's the will of the council to do a survey. Uh, but I do want to point out one of the things I come back to. Actually, I'm far less worried about the snow removal. Uh, than the emergency vehicles. So I think of the inconvenience of having one side parking, but I also think of the inconvenience of having to have the ambulance crew pull that stretcher all the way up half a block if somebody's having a heart attack or if a house is on fire or something like that. And, and, and so that's kind of what I feel like is, the snow removal is certainly an issue. I mean, you know, nobody, everybody wants their street plow because we got to get out, you know. We just saw that, you know, big snowstorm this winter and it's no no joke when it's that much snow. But I certainly don't want to discount that. And I don't want to discount the hassle of having one side street parking. Uh, but I'm also aware too, this this uh, developed situation that you described to us, um, I would be frustrated too. Uh, but I wonder if that's not almost a bellwether. So the fact that it has changed as cars get bigger, that we may hear this uh, more from from more of these streets. And apparently you said back in 2019, the decision was made to handle these piecemeal as they came up and not as a blanket way. Yeah, no, that's correct. So, I mean, that would be my concern as well as the emergency response. Um, you know, when staff goes out, we don't, we don't address whose car it is. We don't address where they come from. Uh, I could, you know, I don't live on Keswick or near Keswick, but I could still park on Keswick if I want, right? So, so we don't know whose cars are whose. We just, we, if we go out and witness these vehicles parked opposite each other, which we have done on Keswick, for us, that's how we handle the policy and we bring it to you all. You know, we don't try and dissect that further. Um, we certainly could survey, but that would be my concern as well. So it's just a deviation from the policy and... Yeah, I mean, so that's one thing I'm not sure. I mean, the survey, again, if the majority of the council wants that, I wouldn't stand in the way of it, but uh, I don't know that that survey response solves that problem. Uh, and for me, that's a, that's a big deal. Yeah. But Any more questions some... for Kent? Right. I still, I Sorry, still I think... Sorry, that was a question, not a comment. My apologies. No. I still think that nothing has been changed. The emergency vehicles, unless the emergency vehicle become bigger, but this is for years. It's the same thing. They was going back and forth. If there is someone, like uh, the snowblower was going back and forth, and it, it was not like really a big uh, problem, unless they talked about this new business who have like really huge trucks. Uh, like barking against, uh, like, better to each other. So. But, yeah, I think we have two options here. Uh, one is to do the survey, and the other is to go for a vote. So um, just wondering what people are thinking. Uh, I will put a motion to do a survey. I don't know. That's, that's right? Well, it, I, it, uh, I'm doing it informal first, okay. just to see uh, if that's okay. I'm with very much what Sean, or Councilor Homerson said, is the emergency vehicle aspect to this is, to me, the driving force behind all of these things. And these guidelines were established to protect that. I am, it stinks that like you had a neighbor that kind of you know peed in the pool for everybody. But, um, and I'm sorry for that, but I, I think we have to say, when it comes to fire trucks and ambulances, we don't want to take risks. So. If everyone else here wants to do a survey, sure, I'm more inclined to say let's accept correspondence. I'm if inclined. you want, uh, if you want to make a motion, you can make a motion. I was just seeing if there was. I think that's okay. Well, there's no. There's if uh, if there is no, I saw there is enough people want to the survey because I kind of like uh, uh, Council Hampton say I support it if like everyone and. I don't know. That's why I, I, I don't know if I should do the motion or you should ask informally. Well, so there's a motion on the table. And so if council uh, wants to have the survey, my recommendation would be to vote no to not, not accept the correspondence and then immediately follow it up with a motion to direct uh, staff to conduct a survey. If council wants to approve it, then they should vote yes. I'm inclined to accept correspondence. Yeah, I, I, I'm inclined to accept correspondence. I think the the challenge is, 
um, I think beyond what this council can can really fix, and I'm inclined to accept the correspondence. And I think we had two over there. So that means that we'll go for a vote. Um, roll call, please. Harmson? Yes. Mo? Yes. Sale? No. Teague? Yes. Alter? No. Dunn? Yes. Uh, motion passes four to two. And then we will move on to item number 10H. I know that Mayor Pro Tem is going to re recuse herself. Yes, yes, yes. This is Ten H is fiscal year 2024 racial equity and social justice grant allocations resolution adopting the racial equity and social justice grant allocations for fiscal year 2024. Can I get a motion to approve, please? So moved. Moved by Don. Second, Mo. Seconded by Mo. And we're going to welcome uh, our HRC chair and commissioner. Yes, welcome. Thank you. Uh, I'm the chair of the Human Rights Commission, Doug Koash, with me as my vice chair, Kelsey Paul Schantz. The Racial Equity and Social Justice Grant is an opportunity available to Iowa City-based organizations, both non- and for-profit, with the purpose of encouraging, empowering, and, enra and engaging racial equity and social justice initiatives through programs, activities, or services that help eliminate inequities in the Iowa City community. The City Council established this grant in 2017. Programs that address one or more of the six priority service areas receive preference. And those service areas are building communities, criminal justice, education, employment, health, and housing. The Human Rights Commission reviews those applications and then forwards its recommendations to the City Council for review and approval. And I'd want to take the opportunity to talk, talk through a little bit of our process on how we, how we do that. Uh, the Commission held two grant informational sessions via Zoom on November 8th and 15th, one over the noon hour, one in the evening. Uh, Commissioners Lusala, Shantz, myself, and Maliabo presented on behalf of the Commission. The recording and slide deck are, were made available on the City's RESJ site. At both informational sessions, the Commissioners provide information on the following, past recipients of the grant, how we define racial equity, social justice, and human rights, the areas of focus, the grant requirements, and things to consider in deciding on a project, advice and tips on filling out the application. We also review the rubric that each commissioner uses to score and review every application, and how we generally arrive at, arrive at those recommendations. After the November 15th informational session, a news release was sent out encouraging those interested in applying for the grant to watch the video from the informational session and review the slide deck. The Commission received applications from December 1st through January 5th. We received 29 applications. We received those formally at our January 23rd meeting along with the rubrics for each individual commissioner to score those applicants. The Commission created the rubric some years back and it was updated in 2022. The total possible points an application can receive on the rubric is 35, and each commissioner uses a point system of one to five to determine what number best reflects their agreement with the certain criteria on the rubric, organizational information, information about the proposal, and the funding information for each application. Commissioners send back their individual scores for each applicant to staff using an Excel document. And then on March 4th, we held a special meeting of the Human Rights Commission to discuss those scores. And we discuss the, we start that discussion with the applicants who receive the highest overall scores and work our way down the list. The recording to that meeting can be found online. After the meeting, all rubrics are collected by staff and are available for viewing. And the staff has sent copies of applicants' rubrics to them upon request. All applicants do receive an email from staff notifying of any meeting dates the commission will be discussing the grant. That also includes an email with the recommendation, the Excel sheet with all the scores, and the date that the recommendation will go in front of city council. So with that, tonight we recommend that 
full funding for the Eastern Iowa chapter of Asian Pacific Islander American Public Affairs, Inside Out Reentry Community, Open Heartland, Better Together Community Development Corporation, and Domestic Violence Intervention Program. We also recommend partial funding for projects by Houses into Homes, United Action for Youth, Indigenous Art Alliance, Escuchamilos, Iowa, Community Crisis Center, and Wright House of Fashion. And I do want to point out that of those 29 applications, that um, ended up in a requested total amount of $542,177.24. So over $500,000 of grants were, were requested of us. We have $100,000 to, to allocate. Um, and I know that last year Chair Lusala came and presented these, these recommendations and, and um, asked for increased funding for the RESJ grants, and I will reiterate that. We keep seeing increased number of applicants, increased amount of funds requested, and it's, it's very difficult to, to discern among all of those, and we want to help as many organizations as we can. Um, so of the 29, we were able to award grants to 11 of those, and $100,000 out of the over $500,000 that was requested. We appreciate the amb ambition in our, in our community to pursue racial equity and social justice. Unfortunately, we're unable to fund all applicants. Um, but we do recommend unanimously the Human Rights Commission by a seven to zero vote approve these recommendations and present them to you tonight for approval. Great, thank you. Any questions? Yeah, I got a couple. Oh. Joko first. I was just going to say, um, I know, thank you for the detailed process uh, overview. And I know that you said that um, during the training sessions or the, the to have the applicants come in and, and sort of learn about the process itself, that you define what these um, grants are for. Can, can you sort of summarize that now um, in terms of like what what would an applicant hear about what the purpose of these grants is? Yes. Um, so the grants, racial equity, social justice, um, the proposal should seek to eliminate inequity in the community, whether it be individual, institutional, or on a structural level. Um, there must be, it must be a new project. We do have some leeway there um, where if organizations were previously funded in one cycle, they can apply to continue that for the next cycle. Um, and we do not allow governments, public schools, colleges, university to be applicants. Um, it's a total of $25,000. Um, we give examples of previous previous awardees um, that have gotten the grant to talk about projects that they've worked on. Um, and Kelsey has the, the PowerPoint help pulled, pulled up, so I'll let her talk more too. Yeah, so during those sessions that you asked about, Megan, um, there is, we provide a definition of how the Human Rights Commission is considering racial equity and social justice. Mm -hmm. So those definitions are in the slide deck, but I can also just um, refer to them now in case that's helpful, that racial equity is a process of eliminating racial disparities and improving outcomes for everyone. It is the intentional and continual practice of changing policies, practices, systems, and structures by prioritizing measurable change in the lives of people of color. Social justice then refers to a fair and equitable division of resources, opportunities, and privileges in society. Um, and then we go on to define human rights as well for the purpose of the commission. Thank you. Can I ask? A <coughs> it's late. We all want, so I'm just going to cut to the chase. I did notice, um, I mean, we're, we've been having this discussion about um, agent, uh, nonprofit agencies, and unfortunately, we are in a situation where there's, you know, a pie, and a lot of agencies. So um, I know that on the application also, um, there was a question that asked, "Have you been funded by the city in the past year?" Right, and I couldn't help but notice that a couple of the play grantees, um, DVIP, Better Together. Um, UIY, they have been funded and they're also pretty well established. And um, they, so I guess I'm wondering, given the fact that this is such a small pot, I'm just wondering rhetorically, I guess, of the wisdom of granting to agencies where they have stronger fundraising mechanisms and um, 
and, and they have the ability to stand up new programs every year, whereas there may be in this list of 29 that there were certainly agencies that might be needing, that that money would actually go further because they are smaller, right? Yeah. I, I and you're right, and that's a conversation that we have, and you, you can watch our meeting for March 4th. You know, we, we, we struggle with that, too. On the one hand, you know, we, we appreciate those organizations that are established because they have the ability to quickly stand up a project that might have some impact, and you know, so we can help them out with that. Whereas you know, if those other, those smaller, Smaller organizations, you know, are, is it going to be sustainable? Are they going, you know, are they going to be able to to continue that? Is it going to be as impactful as as something from a more established organization? Um, and Kelsey, you could probably add some more about our discussions on that. So one of the things I might just mention is that so because we're starting from our rubric scores, so I think you have copies of actually all of our individual scores uh, that's accumulative of all of the seven points that Doug mentioned, but many of those actually pull us towards a place where we're evaluating sustainability. So can the project continue beyond the cycle that we're um, uh, suggesting grant um, be be approved for? Um, and does it have a clear vision of what success looks like? There are some of these questions that lend themselves to individually um, preference over organizations that can answer those questions affirmatively. Um, and so I think it's a really important question for us to consider as a commission, but also if there's a different directive coming from city council of what this is meant to do, that's always helpful as well too. Um, but that is in our current process how we're interpreting and also then how those numbers start to add up. Um, it is making probably a, a difference in the overall um, rubric scores. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I am curious about the report back. So you guys grant money out. Um, we all grant money out. Um, what is the report back to see whether they built capacity, they achieved their goals, and great what's question. their skin in the game if they fail? Yeah, great question. So all, all organizations that receive a grant are required to submit a report um, at the end of the, I think twice during the cycle, is that right? Mm -hmm. One, uh, yeah, um, two times during the cycle um, to report back on how they spent the money, you know, what the, what, how successful that project was. Um, in the past two years, we've also initiated programs with the commission where commissioners are paired with organizations that have received our grant and we work with them and we contact them more often than just those you know two reporting periods um, to you know see how things are going establish those relationships and you know provide any other additional support we can to that to that project I would just say too that um the, the the grants, as you know, they're immediately, those that are approved are immediately distributed. And so in terms of follow-up then for those that um, organizations that are not able to f fulfill like their project as they proposed it, they have to report that back to the city. The city then reports and shares it, that communication with us. Um, question, th first of all, uh, thank you for the work that the commission does going through uh, applications. Uh, that is a, is, a, is a great deal of work, and there's a lot of uh, responsibility that comes along with that, and, and I appreciate uh, all the commission members um, for taking that on. Um, the other question about process a little bit, um, and uh, I apologize, I haven't had a chance to go back and watch the March 4th meeting. Um, when you weigh out the decisions, you mentioned uh, rubric. Rubrics can be very helpful in trying to score things. Um, is that the only criteria, or is there some discussion? What do you do? Uh, what do you do if you have a, an extreme outlier? Because that, so, you have a small number of commissioners, so an outlier can really skew numbers disproportionately. Yeah, so. Great question. Great question. Yeah. So we we start with the rubric scores. We start at the top of the list and work our way down, and then you know as we get to the end then we open it up and and we look at the rest of the rest of the list mm -hmm. where are the outliers are there any projects that a certain commissioner saw that said hey this is worthwhile we can bring those up for discussion as well so you know yeah we don't we, there's no cut off and then we just throw everyone out the window we we do go through everything all nine commissioners have a chance to bring up outliers bring up projects they thought were particularly worthwhile that maybe didn't end up you know at the top of the scores so so yeah there's there's a pretty robust discussion of, of all the all the applicants in that meeting. 
I will say as well too that um, because we do go through a, a, a specific process of starting with those that we have all collectively scored the highest and then going from there, there is an inherent sort of um, uh, agreement of just the collective of where we're moving from at the beginning. But for those that applicants that have said, um, yes, we could do this with partial funding. Um, some applicants say no, it's, it's all or nothing here. But some do say we could do this with partial funding. We take that into account um, and we do actually make notes then about if we want to do partial funding um, so that then we're able to spread mm -hmm. the just $100,000 that we have in our grant applications to more applicants. Sorry, and this is really basic, but you did mention, um, this is specifically for projects, correct? Correct. Okay. Great. Any other questions? All right. Anyone from the public like to address this topic? I do see a hand raised online. Um, I'll welcome Tasha at this time. Welcome. You're muted. We can't hear you. We're going to go to Rachel. Welcome. Good evening. Can you all hear me? We can. Welcome. Thank you. So, um, I just want to say I am an Iowa City resident. My name is Rachel Scott, um, and I represent the Black professionals of Johnson County. And I suggest po postponing the vote on this grant until we have a clearer understanding of the contributions of each organization being considered for it. It is essential to recognize that our organization, along with others, have been constantly overlooked despite our tireless efforts toward bettering our communities. Thus, it is only fitting that any financial assistance be allocated to those who demonstrate tangible impact within our local, local, local communities. To ensure equitable, I'm sorry, it's late, but to ensure that the distribution of the resources are provided to everyone that really needs it and do work in our community, I propose delaying the vote on this grant until we can thoroughly evaluate the merits of each group in question. And we must prioritize supporting organizations that truly make a difference in the community, especially the smaller organizations. Because we are, this is what our second year and we have shown that we do make an impact in our community and with help and grant funding, we can reach more people. And that's pretty much all I have for tonight. Thank you. And Tasha, we'll go to you. Welcome. So you're still on mute. And if anyone is in in person, want to, oh, we can hear you now. All righty. Thank you. Um, my name is Tasha Lard. I am the executive director of Black Professionals of Iowa. And I am here to shed some light to the invaluable contributions of Black Professionals of Iowa within our community. Our organization has tirelessly worked to showcase the vibrant essence of Iowa City, attracting individuals eager to exploit its rich culture and opportunities. More significantly, we have seamlessly aligned our core values with the city's strategic planning, propelling initiatives focused on racial equity, social justice, and human rights. For an entire year, Black professionals of Iowa has been at the forefront of driving meaningful change without any support from the city. Our efforts have been widely recognized and publicly visible, raising the question, why were organizations like ours overlooked for grants, especially when our impact on advancing the city's goals has been undeniable? It is imperative that the city council recognize our and, and support grassroots organizations like ours, whose dedication and results directly contribute to the betterment of Iowa City. We continue to urge you guys to look at other organizations like ours, who may be small, but we're mighty. We've done this work continuously for a year, and if we discuss sustainability, we've done that without any help from the city. And again, because we've brought so many individuals into Iowa City, we would have thought that we would have been considered for some of the funding so that we can continue the work. Thank you for your time and your consideration. Thank you. Um, and we'll go to Ayman. 
Welcome. Good evening, and uh, uh, my name is Ayman Sharif. I'm the executive director of the Center for Worker Justice of Eastern Iowa. I really would like to uh, <clears throat> express our great appreciation for the city of Iowa City and the racial equity and social justice grant and the commission for their um, for their efforts. Um, I'd like to say that we are an established organization here. We've been working for more than a decade continuously to lead successful programs that empower immigrants, low-age workers, and also supporting of affordable housing residents uh, in the county and, and the area here. We are 50, more than 50 percent uh, of uh, uh, immigrants and uh, African-American communities, 40 percent or more or of Latino, Latino communities. So we are pretty much diverse and we are also a member-based organization. We think that a priority must be given always to member-based organizations being um, like a, of more capability to uh, work with community groups and support them which we have been doing successfully for all those years. We've been also depending on this grant, together with other things, to ex uh, expand our work and effort uh, all the time. We see like kind of a problem with the process of this grant. And uh, uh, actually, uh, I really appreciate what uh, uh, Councilman Sean mentioned here regarding the average system that has been used to uh, grade the applications. I just think this is not really suitable or appropriate for, and um, it really skewed the outcome of the uh, the grant, as we could see here. And I will uh, say, for example, for our for our. Uh, application for this is just an example we have been graded uh uh let me just i will see that very quickly like six six times or six of the commissioners graded us either above 30 of the 35 or uh, in the middle in the 20s only one commissioner graded us like very unusual low of seven, which has not been Thank graded you. to any other Thank application. You. Yep. And that, that really Hey, Ayman, that was three minutes. Thank you. Uh, welcome uh, to anyone in person that wants to speak. Please state your name and city you're from. Roy Sam Porter, Iowa City, and I have some correspondence for you. Okay, uh, the chair and the vice chair um, say, this grant opportunity is available to Iowa City-based organizations, both for nonprofit and profit, with the purpose of encouraging, empowering, and engaging racial equity and social justice initiatives through programs, activities, or services that help eliminate inequities in the Iowa City community. What they they stopped at that with there's a period and they stopped. What they didn't say is programs that address one or more of the six priority service areas will receive preference. Building communities, criminal justice, education, employment, health, and housing. The goal of race equity grant is to invest in communities most impacted by structural racism and oppression, support community and client-centered approaches to civil organizations and leadership. 
We got five black grassroots organizations, five, Black Voices Project, Black Professionals of Johnson County, Sankofa, New Creations Child Care, and the Iowa Immigrant Worker Welcome Network. All five grassroots organizations doing the work in our community and not one of us received a dollar. I want to say the Black Voices Project met the criteria, and I'll tell you how. In education, school environment, access improvements in addressing discrimination in schools, partnership with the Iowa City Community School District, several school board members, and the superintendent are members of the Black Voices, where they attend meetings regularly and are highly trusted stakeholders. This group have worked collaboratively, making recommendations and having ongoing dialogues, evaluating the impact of educational campaigns through surveys and assessments. Two, housing. Aim to ensure that people with Section 8 vouchers and those living in public housing understand their rights and know how to navigate the appeals process effectively. Legal interventions. Measure the success of legal support in, com in combating housing discrimination, access to affordable housing, and ensuring fair treatment for all residents. Number three, policing, building communities. Partnering with the Iowa City Police Department on community outreach, Iowa City Police volunteer for our annual Martin Luther King Parade and, and Martin Luther King Celebration held at Mercer Park. The Iowa City Police officers volunteer to help serve food for 300 plus people at our annual Henry Harper Community Soul Food Dinner. Iowa City Police officers volunteer for our annual Juneteenth Celebration held downtown Iowa City, feeding 1,200 plus people. The City of Iowa City, there is a partnership building communities. Partnership with the City of Iowa City Parks and Rec Recreation Thank to you. utilize their facilities. You. So I gave Thank you these. You. Okay, I just want to say Thank, Thank you. you these. We, we have it. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else like to address this topic? Seeing and uh, hearing no one else, uh, council discussion. I'm going to be brutally honest. My head hurts really bad. It's 1030. Um, I'm very comfortable moving this to defer when we can have a, a broader conversation, have some more conversations with other folks. Um, that's just me, honestly. Just, yeah. I guess the, I guess the, one of my I think one of the things that's happening um, with all of our granting is there are concerns at how at how the process is happening or the discussions are happening. Um, we heard it tonight. Um, you know the rubric that's being used. Um, certainly, most granting um, committees have some discretion, is subjective um, to a great degree. Uh, I've been on several granting committees, and there is not one that I've been on that you go top score and stop. I think this council is at a point where we need to look at all of the granting opportunities that come through the city, or the majority of them, I, you know, I think I know all of them uh, because they come before us. And we have to have discussion, uh, review some of the, um, some of the comments that's been made to give direction, not to point out anyone, but to give direction. And this isn't just related to the HRC. This is related to any of the granting bodies that this city has. As far as the was before us currently, again, it would be a huge undertaking, I think, for this council to to, you know, look at all of the applicants here. We have other applications that are coming before us from other um, uh, commissions like our uh, HCDC just you know did some they'll be we'll receive recommendations from them and of course we'll be able to re review in those recommendations at the time when it's before us personally do I think that um, you know 
after watching the video of any of our commissions, um, certainly I can see um, where if I was a part of it, you know, I would have made um, some different recommendations or uh, brought up some concerns in the moment, but I'm not a part of that. And the commissioners are tasked to look at the grants and make a re recommendation to this council. This council has the ability to revise it. There are 29 applications over $500,000, it is an impossible task that I think we ultimately give to any of our granted bodies. I do see great opportunity for us to uh, give greater direction. I think the commission, I just heard it tonight, would be welcome to any type of um, further direction that uh, the council would like to give. I believe that we, again, need to review all of our granted process, but when it comes to what's before us tonight, I know everybody that spoke tonight. I absolutely love everybody that spoke tonight That uh, from the public. I know the work that they do. I believe in it. It is awesome and amazing, um, but I think what's before us tonight, as far as like, you know, the, uh, what's been proposed, I understand there can be a lot of conversation said about how they arrived at these 11, but at the end of the day, I think the commissioners did it um, based on their information, their knowledge, their what they believe um, represented the definition of, and the meaning of this uh, grant. So I will be supporting um, the allocations as they are, but I would say to this council that we must have a work session that brings all of this to bear and we have a discussion. Um, so I'll leave it at that for now. I would agree with that. Um, I served on HCDC for five years and um, over time with different people in the commission, that while the applications stay the same and the purpose ostensibly is the same, there's oftentimes um, there can be movement, just calibration changes. Um, so I think that, and, and additionally, when I was on HCDC, there was a lot of discussion actually from HCDC that we didn't know what one hand was doing with the other. What were other grant giving commissions doing and who was getting the funding and whatnot? And that at that time we talked about, it would be really useful for us to know so that there wouldn't necessarily be overlap. Um, yeah, unless it was sort of an understood, like, ah, this is for this and this is for that. Or the point being that I think that um, I very much um, second the mayor's um, sense that there needs to be a look by council uh, because it's not really fair to the commissions and certainly isn't fair to the applicants to try to figure out where there might be moving goalposts and or where the applications themselves, and that's probably the better way to say it, where the applications themselves are um, could be made more clear and could be more helpful in terms of the information that they ask. Um, so I absolutely think, I, I realize I'm talking about something that is not in front of us at the moment, um, but I think this it's, it's something that we owe to the, the commissions um, because the people have volunteered to be appointed on it and 110% for the people who are applying for, for the entities that are applying for grants. Um, and just my two cents since I'm still at the mic. Um, I, I think that there really should be um, perhaps without trying to take away the autonomy and the hard work done by commissions, um, I think that there can be a little bit of um, investigation or, or, or discussion about the purpose of what each commission's grants are for. And because um, we certainly have on, in some entities, it's like stuff for operational or, or standing up larger projects. And, and so I think it just makes sense to have that conversation about what are all of these grant giving commissions, what is their, what's the, the purpose? So at any rate, that's 
sorry, that was like seven to nine cents um, rather than two. But I support this for now, and then moving forward, we need to make some um, some decisions that'll clarify the process. Sorry. I'll just make a really quick comment, piggybacking off that. Um, I think you probably believe this as I do. Um, if there is any lack of clarity um, that you're referring to, um, that is not the responsibility of the commissions. That is that is our responsibility. So um, bringing that up, that is not uh, to say, oh, the commissions have failed at anything. Um, that is us failing at making your uh, important service jobs that are unpaid um, easier and, and more streamlined. So um, in any case, with that is is I would give personal apologies. You took the word out of my mouth, Councillor Dunn. I think it's our job to make the rules and procedures better. And so we'll do that. Uh, we need to do that. Because that's what I heard from the from from Rachel, from Tasha, from Ayman, from Roy San is you know there's there's frustration they didn't get the grant, but there's also a questioning of process. And so we can fix the process. I also think that we have commissioners that we've empowered to make decisions and I think we um, we want to leverage that and so when they make a recommendation I think it's it, we would never get our work done if we re guessed everything that every commission did so I'm inclined to say yes and we will work on making a better process So I think a couple of things, uh, just to kind of, uh, Bruce uh, said a couple of things I just kind of want to want to agree with. First of all, um, the full-throated, uh, full-chested um, uh, acknowledgement of all of the, uh, and again, I, I also know the people that called in and I know the work they're doing in this community and, and uh, Supervisor Porter, uh, the work that uh, she does in our community, um, no question. Um, and, and I think... Uh, of the quality of the impact uh, and everything else um, just I just think that's that's worth noting um, I also feel uh, something you had said uh, mr. mayor um, if you know might have in that position may have made some different choices and I think that that's that's something that that resonated with me um, yeah I I think one thing that uh, it, agreeing kind of talking about um, what we need to do to make this better and one thing that commissions don't necessarily have is that 10,000 foot view so one of the things we see is we see when we have these different programs or at least what I've noticed we have these different programs and we're trying to um, you know have them focused in on, on laser focus on on different aspects of our community we want to make better which is generally okay but I think one of the things I've noticed is that sometimes accidentally these you know again the left hand not knowing what the right hand is doing we end up with sort of um, skewing a little bit like all of a sudden you know one organization just gets a lot while some others get left out in the cold and not that there was an overarching goal to do that necessarily not certainly none that I've ever been aware of either by individual commissions or by different commissions but sort of a, an end effect so I feel like you know that is something that um, you know that, that we can see at that 10,000 foot view and that certainly creates rather than creating positive momentum in our communities with our grant programs which you know at the end of the day as a city you know I'm very proud of what we do with our grant programs but with our administration of it obviously you know people that don't get grants are going to be upset um, but I think this is more than that I think there's some some real deeper issues that are that, that I I see and I recognize and I think they're fixable um, I don't know that I'm, I'm willing to vote against this tonight, um, but also I also want to uh, just in, in Councillor Dunn's early thing about deferring, um, you know, we have one council member, this is an important discussion, one council member who has, has left uh, uh, and uh, one who is just barely holding on. <laughs> um, and so I would also be okay just that's two important voices. We're, we have one, one important voice who has to recuse themselves. So we're already kind of shorthanded with our full council taking this on. I would be okay with deferring and seconding. Did you make a motion, Andrew? I haven't, no. Um, the, the, I mean, I, and as much as I don't want to push, you know, sure. I want to get things, you know, have, have organizations get the benefit of this, right? Because these are some good organizations that should probably point out too, some good projects too that, that the, the, the commission has, has picked, right? Nothing against any of those groups um, in my statements, um, you know, at all, or against any of the commission members. I want to make uh, certain that, you know, the, the council, it seems amendable to having 
a work session, you know, totally on the granting process. Any other things that, you know, we have concerns uh, from, we heard some today, there'll be more. Um, we can, we'll have that discussion. Um, so I just wanted to make that uh, clarification that we will have a work session on that. So if, um, if, if there is, I'm, I'm ready to make a decision because I really think that that grant process, that's a whole nother conversation that we must have that I think we have to have. But so I don't know where people are and are people ready to make decisions? Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, I'll, I'll make one note, uh, Mr. Mayor, because this is a resolution under state law, ordinance and resolutions require a majority of the entire council, four votes, whereas motions just require a, a majority of the quorum present. That would be three votes for what it's worth. So four votes to pass. Okay, great. Thank you. We're going to go with the roll call, please. Okay. Harmson? Yes. Mo. Yes. Teague? Yes. Alter? Yes. Done. Yes. Motion passes five to zero. Okay, and thanks to everybody for uh, that came and speak on this item. Mayor, could we get a motion to accept the correspondence? Yes, could I get a motion to accept correspondence so that moved. came out? Second. Uh, moved by Don, seconded by Alter. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes six to five to zero. Yes. All right. And then we're going to move on to item number 10i, assessment schedule. This is a resolution adopting an assessment schedule of unpaid mowing cleanup of property, snow removal, sidewalk repair and stop box repair charges, and directing the cl uh, clerk to certify the same to the Johnson County Treasurer for collection in the same manner as property taxes. I would, would like a motion to approve, please. So moved. Second, Mo. Moved by Don, seconded by uh, Mo. Anyone from the public like to discuss this topic? Seeing no one present or online, uh, council discussion. I did want to just uh, make mention that we received an email from property owner at um, a property owner that stated that they closed on their house 3-20-2024. But these assessed charges were from 5 2023 $250, and then from uh, November 10, 2023 of $300. So. There was uh, an email, actually. Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, we saw that email. I spoke with the attorney, Sue Dulek, in our office who handles these, and she said we would just take him off. And that that was an appropriate objection. And there was an email to that effect, actually, yeah. that came out. Yeah, she responded. Yeah. Oh, I didn't see that. Yeah, it was okay. it was rather late, Mayor. Okay, thanks. All right. So for clarification, because it is in the uh, public document. There was um, a, I'm sorry. There was a revised uh, schedule in the late handouts today that took those two off. Thank you. Yep. So. I just wanted to make it at least clear for the council, I wasn't aware, but thank you, um, that um, that uh, individual is not on a part of this conversation anymore. Any other comments by council? Roll call, please. Mo? Uh, yes. Silla? Yes. Teague? Yes. Alter? Yes. Dunn? Yes. Harmson? Yes. Motion passes. Um, six to zero. We are on to item number 11, council appointments, 11A, Civil Service Commission, one vacancy to fill a four-year term, uh, April 2nd, 2024 through April 3rd, 2028. And there is one male requirement. Civil Service. Okay. Yeah. Is that right, Kelly? I, th I had it down as one none, but maybe I, maybe that's mistaken. Uh, I don't think I had it updated when I sent it oh, to you. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> uh, Mr. Mayor, I would put forward uh, Richard Wiss for this. Continuation. 
continuation. Okay. I would also. It would be a continuation, yes. Yeah. Continuation. Right. That works. Yep. I would support it. Yeah. Okay. Um, and maybe we'll just do them each one by one. Uh, any other nominations? Hearing none, can I get a motion to appoint um, Richard Wiss so to the Civil Service Commission? So moved. Second, Harmson. Moved by Don, seconded by Harmson. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, motion passes, 6-2-0. We're gonna move on to item number 11B, which is the Human Rights Commission. One vacancy to fill an unexpired term upon appointment through December 31st, 2025. And this um, does have a mail requirement. How many do we know, like, how many black people there? I, I don't know. I apologize, I'm not prepared to advance offer. anybody or offer anything. I'm losing my energy. Okay. Move to defer for next meeting. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm fine yes. with deferral. I'm yeah. fine with that. Okay. Um, we're going to defer 11B, the Human Rights Commission, to the um, April 12. 16th. Uh, can I get a motion, please? Move. I'm moved. Second. Okay. <laughs> moved by Salah, seconded by Alter. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, motion passes six to zero. Um, 11C, Libra Library Board of Trustees, one vacancy to fill an unexpired term upon appointment through June 30th, 2029. There is one female requirement. I, I didn't connect with anyone on this yeah. list. I, I would motion to defer. Second. I will second that motion. Okay, uh, there's a motion to defer uh, made by Alter, seconded by Mo. All in favor say aye. 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 And we're gonna defer to April 16th. Um, any opposed? Motion passes six to zero. On to item number 12, announcements of vacancies new. 12A is uh, ad hoc truth and reconciliation commission. One vacancy for an unexpired term through upon appointment through December 31st, 2024. Airport commission, one vacancy to fill a four year term July 1st, 2024 through June 30th, 2028. Community police review board to vacancies two vacancies to fill a four-year term July 1st, 2024 through June 30th, 2028. Historic Preservation Commission at large, one vacancy to fill a three-year term July 1st, 2024 through June 30th, 2027. Historic Preservation Commission, College Street, one vacancy to fill a three-year term July 1st, 2024 through June 30th, 2027. Historic Preservation Commission, East College Street, one vacancy to fill an unaspired term plus a three-year term upon appointment June 30th, 2027. Historic Preservation Commission, Willow Avenue, one vacancy to fill an unexpired term, plus a three-year term upon appointment through June 30th, 2027. Housing and Community Development Commission, three vacancies to fill a three-year term, July 1st, 2024, through June 30th, 2027. Can I get a motion to accept correspondence? A move. Sorry. Second move. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes six to zero. Uh, item number 13 is announcements of vacancies previous. Ad hoc truth and reconciliation commission. One vacancy to fill on expired term. Applications must be received by 5 p.m. Tuesday, April 30th, 2024. Airport zoning board of adjustment. One vacancy to fill a five-year term. Airport zoning commission. One vacancy to fill a six-year term. Historic Preservation Commission, Jefferson Street. One vacancy to fill a three-year term. Vacancies will remain open until filled. We're at item number 14, city council information. Really quick, there is the... Um, Badging with from the Iowa City Fire Department tomorrow at the firefighters. Um, it's sort of an awards assembly as well. I can't even speak. It's a. It looks like it's a reception for people who've been doing good first responder stuff and badging, and it is at Terry True Blood tomorrow night. Oh, tomorrow night. Six thirty p.m. Thank you. Okay. 
And the uh, question, if when we defer those to next meeting, is this means people kind of lie, right? <laughs> um, Between it's now still and open. Then? If it's open. It's open, yeah. I'm sorry, was the question whether they open back up for applications? Uh -huh. I, I think the answer is no, unless you do something to the contrary. If you do that, you would probably want to extend from April 16th to a later date so that you would allow sufficient time for folks to get word, apply, and close. That's what I thought about the deferring. Oh, well, was it for that reason or just because the hour was late? Because I was yeah. retired and didn't yeah. talk yeah. to anybody in the list. No, I, because I just did not see like some people that they can be good fit here. I think at this point we'll have to discuss that at the next meeting, because that's not the agenda item right now. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. What do you think, uh, City Attorney? I'm sorry, what's the question? I said, like, how are we going to solve this if we already pass the item? Uh, well, I, I agree. You already passed the item, and um, whereas not for long, um, I think it would be appropriate to move on. I think the mayor's suggestion is that if you don't like the candidates, uh, let me phrase that more diplomatically, if you think that uh, we would benefit from having additional applicants, certainly you could do that at the next meeting, um, just reopen. Mm -hmm. That's what I thought for the fair. Wasn't clear. Yep. Mm -hmm. Any other updates? All right. Item number 15 is a report on items from city staff, city manager's office. Nothing tonight. City attorney's office. Uh, uh, city clerk and I met with the Charter Review Commission at their first meeting last night. Uh, I was uh, uniformly impressed. They appeared to have done their homework and read minutes from the last session 10 years ago. I think it's gonna be a great group. Great. Good. City clerk's office. Ditto. <laughs> All right. We're at item number 16. Could I get a motion to adjourn? Move. Move, move, move. Move by Dunn, second by Sala. And all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. We are adjourned. <laughs>